Section 83 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 10. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 83. The Story of St. Patrick, 5th Century, by Patrick Weston Joyce. When Patrick was a boy of sixteen, he was, as we are told by himself in his writings, taken captive and brought to Ireland. This was about the year 403. He was sold as a slave to a certain rich man named Milko, who employed him to herd sheep and swine on the slopes of Slemish Mountain, in the present county Antrim. Here he spent six years of his life. If he felt at first heartbroken and miserably lonely, as no doubt he did, he soon recovered himself and made nothing of the hardships he endured on the bleak hillside, for in his solitude his mind was turned to God, and every spare moment was given up to devotions. He tells us in his own earnest and beautiful words, I was daily employed tending flocks, and I prayed frequently during the day and the love of God was more and more enkindled in my heart. My fear and faith were increased, and my spirit was stirred, so much so that in a single day I poured out my prayers a hundred times, and nearly as often in the night. Nay, even in the woods and mountains I remained, and rose before the dawn to my prayer in frost and snow and rain. Neither did I suffer any injury from it, nor did I yield to any slothfulness, such I now experience, for the Spirit of the Lord was fervent within me. But he stood alone in the little world of light and holiness, for his master was a pagan, and though the people he mixed with were bright and lovable, they too were all pagans, grossly superstitious, but beyond that, with little idea of religion of any kind. At the end of six years of slavery, Patrick escaped, and made his way through many hardships and dangers to his home and family. During his residence in Ireland, he had become familiar with the language of the people, and the memory of the pagan darkness in which they lived haunted him day and night, so that he formed the resolution to devote his life to their conversion. His steadfast will was shown even at this early period by the manner in which he set about preparing himself for his noble work. He first studied with great diligence for about four years in the great monastic school of St. Martin of Tours, and subsequently under St. Germain of Auxerre for about the same length of time, after which he continued his preparations in an island near the Italian coast, and elsewhere, till he was ready to begin his mission. During all this time his thoughts were ever turning lovingly to Ireland, and he had dreams and visions about it. Once he dreamed, as he tells us, that a man from Ireland came to him and gave him a letter, which began with the words, The Voice of the Irish. Whilst I was reading the letter, he goes on to say, I imagined at the moment that I heard the voices of many, who were near the wood of Foklut, which is beside the western ocean, crying out as if with one voice, We entreat thee, O holy youth, to come and still walk amongst us and I was exceedingly afflicted in my heart and could read no more, but quickly awoke. Having received authority and benediction from Pope Celestine, he set out for Ireland. On his way through Gaul, news came of the death of Palladius, and as this left Ireland without a bishop, Patrick was consecrated bishop in Gaul by a certain holy prelate named Amator. Embarking for Ireland, he landed on the Wicklow coast, but having been expelled like his predecessor, he sailed northwards, and finally disembarked with his companions at Lacale, in the present county Down. Dico, the chief of the district, thinking they were pirates, hastily armed his followers and sallied forth to expel them. But when they appeared in view, he was so struck by their calm and dignified demeanor, that instead of attacking, he saluted them respectfully, and invited them to his house. Here Patrick announced his mission and explained his doctrine, and Dico and his whole family became Christians and were baptized, the first of the Irish converted by St. Patrick. 
As there was no church, the chief presented him with a saval, or barn, for divine service, on the site of which a monastery was subsequently erected in honor of the saint, which for many ages was held in great veneration. And the memory of the happy event is preserved to this day in the name of the little village of Saul, near Downpatrick. He remained in this neighborhood for some time, and the people, following the example of the chief, listened to his preaching and were baptized in great numbers. St. Patrick adopted, from the very beginning, a bold and courageous plan of preaching the gospel in Ireland. He always made straight for the palaces and other great houses, and began by attempting to convert the kings and chiefs. He was well aware of the veneration of the clansmen for their ruling families, and he knew that once the king had become a Christian, the people would soon follow. He had experienced the success of this plan in Saul, and now he came to the bold resolution to go to Tara and present himself before King Laguerre and his court. Bidding farewell to his friend Dico, he sailed southward to the mouth of the Boyne, whence he set out on foot for Tara with his companions. Soon after leaving the boat, night fell on them, and they were hospitably entertained at the house of a chief, whom the saint converted with his whole family. One of the children, a youth to whom Patrick gave the name of Benin, or Benignus, from his gentle disposition, became so attached to him that he insisted on going along with him next morning. Thenceforward, Benin was Patrick's constant companion and beloved disciple, and after the death of his master, he succeeded him as Archbishop of Armagh. The saint and his little company arrived at the Hill of Slain on Easter Eve, A.D. 433. Here he prepared to celebrate the festival, and towards nightfall, as was then the custom, he lighted the paschal fire on the top of the hill. It so happened that at this very time the king and his nobles were celebrating a festival of some kind at Tara, and the attendants were about to light a great fire on the hill, which was part of the ceremonial. Now there was a law that while this fire was burning, no other should be kindled in the country all round, on pain of death. And accordingly, when the king and his courtiers saw the fire ablaze on the hill of Slain, nine miles off, they were much astonished at such an open violation of the law. The monarch instantly called his druids and questioned them about it, and they said, If that fire which we now see be not extinguished tonight, it will never be extinguished, but will overtop all our fires, and he that has kindled it will overturn thy kingdom." whereupon the king, in great wrath, instantly set out in his chariot with a small retinue, nine chariots in all, and having arrived near Slain, he summoned the strangers to his presence. He had commanded that none should rise up to show them respect. But when they presented themselves, one of the courtiers, Eric, the son of Dago, struck with the saint's commanding appearance, rose from his seat, and saluted him. This Eric was converted, and became afterwards bishop of Slain, and to this day there is, on the bank of the Boyne, near Slain, a little ruined oratory called from him St. Eric's Hermitage. The result of this interview was what St. Patrick most earnestly desired. He was directed to appear next day at Tara, and give an account of his proceedings before the assembled court. On the summit of the hill at Slain, at the spot where Patrick lighted his paschal fire, there are still the ruins of a monastery erected in commemoration of the event. The next day was Easter Sunday. Early in the morning, Patrick and his companions set out for the palace, and on their way they chanted a hymn in the native tongue, an invocation for protection against the dangers and treachery by which they were beset, for they had heard that persons were lying in wait to slay them. This noble and beautiful hymn was long held in great veneration by the people of this country, and we still possess copies of it in a very old dialect of the Irish language. In the history of the spread of Christianity, it would be difficult to find a more singular and impressive scene than was presented at the court of King Laguerre on that memorable Easter morning. Patrick was robed in white, as were also his companions. He wore his mitre and carried his crozier in his hand, and when he presented himself before the assembly, Dobtha, Laguerre's chief poet, rose to welcome him, contrary to the express commands of the king. The saint, 
all aflame with zeal and unawed by the presence of king and court, explained to the assembly the leading points of the Christian doctrine, and silenced the king's druids in argument. Dubtha became a convert, and thenceforward devoted his poetical talents to the service of God and Laguerre gave permission to the strange missionaries to preach their doctrines throughout his dominions. The king himself, however, was not converted, and for the remaining thirty years of his life he remained an unbeliever, while the paganism of the whole country was rapidly going down before the fiery energy of the great missionary. Patrick next proceeded to Tileton, where, during the celebration of the national games, he preached for a week to the assembled multitudes, making many converts, among whom was Colonel Golben, brother to King Laguerre, the ancestor of the O'Donnells of Tyrconnell. We find him soon afterwards making for the plain where stood the great national idol, Crom Cruach, with the twelve lesser idols, all of which he destroyed. About the year 438, with the concurrence of King Laguerre, he undertook the task of revising the Brehon Law. He was aided by eight others, among them King Laguerre himself, and at the end of three years this committee of nine produced a new code, free from all pagan customs and ordinances, which was ever after known as Cain Patrick, or Patrick's Law. This law book, which is also called Sancus Moore, has been lately translated and published. In his journey through Connaught, he met the two daughters of King Laguerre, Ethnia the Fair, and Fidelma the Ruddy, near the palace of Crogan, where they lived at that time in fosterage with their two druid tutors. They had come out one morning at sunrise to wash their hands in a certain spring well, as was their custom, and were greatly astonished to find Patrick and his companions at the well, with books in their hands, chanting a hymn. Having never seen persons in that garb before, the virgins thought at first that they were beings from the she, or fairy hills, but when the first surprise was over, they fell into conversation with them, and inquired whence they had come. And Patrick gently replied, It were better for you to confess to our true God than to inquire concerning our race. They eagerly asked many questions about God, his dwelling place, whether in the sea, in rivers, in mountainous places, or in valleys, how knowledge of him was to be obtained, how he was to be found, seen, and loved with other inquiries of a like nature. The saint answered all their questions, and explained the leading points of the faith, and the virgins were immediately baptized and consecrated to the service of religion. On the approach of Lent, he retired to the mountain which has ever since borne his name, Croag Patrick, or Patrick's Hill, where he spent some time in fasting and prayer. About this time, A.D. 449, the seven sons of Amalgade, king of Connaught, were holding a meeting in Tyrolli, to which Patrick repaired. He expounded his doctrines to the wondering assembly, and the seven princes with twelve thousand persons were baptized. After spending seven years in Connaught, he visited successively Ulster, Leinster, and Munster, in each of which he preached for several years. Soon after entering Leinster, he converted, at the palace beside Nos, where the Leinster kings then resided, the two princes, Elin and Oliol, sons of King Dunling, who both afterwards succeeded to the throne of their father. And at Cashel, the seat of the kings of Munster, he was met by the king Angus, the son of Natfri, who conducted him into the palace on the rock with the greatest reverence, and was at once baptized. Wherever St. Patrick went, he founded churches, and left them in charge of his disciples. In his various journeys, he encountered many dangers, and met with numerous temporary repulses. But his courage and resolution never wavered, and success attended his efforts in almost every part of his wonderful career. He founded the See of Armagh about the year 455, and made it the head sea of all Ireland. The greater part of the country was now filled with Christians and with churches, and the mission of the venerable apostle was drawing to a close. He was seized with his death illness in Saul, the scene of his first triumph, and he breathed his last on the 17th of March, in or about the year 465, in the 78th year of his age. 
The news of his death was the signal for universal mourning. From the remotest districts of the island, clergy and laity turned their steps towards the little village of Saul to pay the last tribute of love and respect to their great master. They celebrated the obsequies for twelve days and nights without interruption, joining in the ceremonies as they arrived in succession. And in the language of one of his biographers, the blaze of myriads of torches made the whole time appear like one continuous day. He was buried with great solemnity at Dundalethglas, the old residence of the princes of Eulidia. And the name, in the altered form of Don Patrick, commemorates to all time the saint's place of interment. End of section 83《セクション84 of England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nather The World's Story, Volume 10 England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales Edited by Eva March Tappan《セクション84 The Island of Saints and Scholars 7th and 8th centuries by Patrick Weston Joyce In ancient Ireland, religion and education went hand in hand, so that in tracing their history it is impossible to separate them. By far the greatest part of the education of the country was carried on by or under the direction of priests and monks who always combined religious with secular teaching. From the middle of the 6th century, Schools rapidly arose all over the country, most of them in connection with monasteries. Some had very large numbers of students. For instance, we are told that there were 3,000 under St. Finan at Clonart, and some other schools, such as Bangor, had as many. A few of the students resided in the college, such as sons of kings and chiefs, and those who were literary foster children of the professors. But the most usual arrangement was that each student lived in a little hut of wood and sods built by himself, or perhaps two or more joined and built a more commodious house for common use. Whole streets of these little houses surrounded the monastery. The huts of the scholars of St. Movi of Glasnevin near Dublin extended along the banks of the river Tolka near the present bridge. At stated times the students came forth in crowds to hear the lectures of the professors, which were often given in the open air. In all the more important schools there were students from foreign lands. The majority were from Great Britain, from which they came in fleet loads, as Aldehelm, an English bishop of the year 705, expressed it. Numbers also came from the continent, among whom were some princes, Alfred, king of Northumbria, and Dagobert II, king of France, both when in exile in the 7th century found an asylum and were educated in Ireland, and others of like rank might be named. We get some idea of the numbers of foreigners from the words of Angus de Chaldee, an Irish writer of the ninth century, who mentions by name many of the Romans, Gauls, Germans, Britons, and even Egyptians, all of whom died in Ireland. Venerable Bede, describing the ravages of the Yellow Plague in 664, says, quote, This pestilence did no less harm in the island of Ireland. Many of the nobility and of the lower ranks of the English nation were there at that time, and some of them devoted themselves to a monastic life. Others chose to apply themselves to study. The Scots willingly received them all, and took care to supply them with food, as also to furnish them with books to read, and their teaching, all gratis. End quote. In the course of three or four centuries from the time of St. Patrick, Ireland became the most learned country in Europe, and it came to be known by the name now so familiar to us, Insula Sanctorum et Doctorum, the island of saints and scholars. In these great seminaries, all branches of knowledge then known were taught. They were, in fact, the models of our present universities. And besides those persons preparing for a religious life, Great numbers of young men, both native and foreign, the sons of kings, chiefs, and others attended them to get a good general education. Laymen who distinguished themselves as scholars were often employed as professors in the monastic schools. One of the most eminent of the professors in the College of Monaster Boys was Flan of the Monastery, a layman of the 11th century, 
several of whose poems, as well as his book of annals, are preserved. But some few schools were purely lay and professional, for law, medicine, poetry, or literature, and these were taught generally by laymen. At these colleges, whether clerical or lay, they had various degrees, as there are in modern universities. The highest was that of Olaf, or doctor, and there were Olafs of the several professions, so that a man might be an Olaf poet, an Olaf historian, an Olaf builder, etc., just as we have now doctors of law, medicine, literature, and music. The full course for an Olaf was twelve years. The lower degrees had shorter periods. Men of learning were held in great estimation and much honored. They had many valuable allowances and privileges, and an Olaf sat at table next to the king or chief. Great number of Irishmen went to teach and to preach the gospel in Great Britain, Wales, and Scotland. The Picts of Scotland, who then occupied the greatest part of the country, were converted by St. Columba and his monks from Iona, and the whole western coasts of England and Wales abound in memorials of Irish missionaries. The monastery of Lindisfarne in Northumbria, which became so illustrious in after ages, was founded in 634 by Aidan, an Irish monk from Iona, and for thirty years after its foundation it was governed by him and by two other Irish bishops, Finnan and Colman, in succession. So we see that Mr. Lecky had good reason for his statement that, quote, England owed a great part of her Christianity to Irish monks who labored among her people before the arrival of Augustine, end quote. Whole crowds of ardent and learned Irishmen travelled to the continent, spreading Christianity and general knowledge among people ten times more rude and dangerous in those days than the inhabitants of these islands. What, says Eric, a well-known French writer of the ninth century, what shall I say of Ireland, who, despising the dangers of the deep, is migrating with almost her whole train of philosophers to our coasts? Irish professors and teachers were in those times held in such estimation that they were employed in most of the schools and colleges of Great Britain and the continent, and Irish teachers of music were quite as eminent and as much sought after as those of literature and philosophy. We know that Charlemagne, who was crowned Emperor of the West, A.D. 800, held the learned men from Ireland in great respect and often invited them as guests to his table, and half a century later, Johannes Scotus Erigena, i.e. John the Irish Scot, the greatest scholar of his day, was on terms of affectionate intimacy with Charles the Bold, King of France. To this day, in many towns of France, Germany, Switzerland, and Italy, Irishmen are venerated as patron saints. Nay, they found their way even to Iceland, for we have the best authority for the statement that when the Norwegians first arrived at that island, they found there Irish books, bells, croziers, and other traces of Irish missionaries. For four or five hundred years after the time of St. Patrick, the monasteries were unmolested, and learning was cultivated within their walls. In the ninth and tenth and the beginning of the eleventh century, science and art, the Gaelic language, and learning of every kind were brought to their highest state of perfection. But a change for the worse had set in. The Danish inroads broke up most of the schools and threw everything into disorder. Then the monasteries were no longer the quiet and safe asylums they had been. They became, indeed, rather more dangerous than other places, so much did the Danes hate them and learning and art gradually declined in Ireland. There was a revival in the time of Brian Boru, but this, too, was arrested by the troubles of the Anglo-Norman invasion. End of section 84「Section 85 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales – Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia O'Rourke's Tower and Great Cross, Clonmacnoise, Photograph, page 434. Many different theories have been advanced to account for the famous round towers that are scattered through Ireland, but the generally accepted explanation is that they were built during the ninth and tenth centuries as places of refuge from marauding bands of Viking pirates. The one shown in the illustration is known as O'Rourke's Tower, and is thought to have been built early in the 10th century. It has lost its roof, 
but is even now sixty-two feet high, the walls being nearly four feet thick. It was finally located as a watchtower, for it commanded long stretches of the river in both directions, and also an ancient causeway that led across the bog on the Connaught side. As has been said, it was large and roomy enough to contain all the officiating priests of Clonmacnoise, with their pyxes, vestments, and books, and though the pagan Dane or the wild monsterman might rush on in rapid inroad, yet the solitary watcher on the tower was ready to give warning and collect within the protecting pillar all holy men and things until the tyranny was overpassed. The great cross is made of a single stone. On it are the following inscriptions. A prayer for Flam, son of Malzichlen, and a prayer for Colman, who made this cross on the King Flam. There are also sculptures. In one of them, St. Kieran stands with a hammer in one hand and a mallet in the other, to indicate that he was the founder of Clonmacnois. Other sculptures represent scenes in the Passion of Our Saviour. End of section 85. This recording is in the public domain. Section 86 of England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales Read for LibriVox.org by Monica M.C. The Book of Kells, Seventh Century by Charles Johnston and Carita Spencer In the beginning it was almost impossible to get a sufficient supply of books for the new monasteries, as the copying of manuscripts was a slow matter. Such continental monasteries as those founded by Columbanus at Luxeuil, Fontaine and Bobbio got the supply of books from the Irish schools, and up to the 10th century it was the custom of the Irish teachers to carry books from their island home to the schools on the continent. There are numerous instances of donations of manuscripts made by Irish scholars to foreign schools. Thus, in 823, a learned Irishman gave a number of books to the monastery of Bobbio. Two of these may still be seen in the Ambrosian Library at Milan. Not long after, in 841, Marcus, an Irish bishop, who was returning with his nephew from a pilgrimage to Rome, visited the monastery of St. Gall in Switzerland. He was so charmed with the view that he remained there for the rest of his life, and, out of gratitude for the hospitality he received, willed his books to the monastery. As all books at this time were written by hand, penmanship was one of the most cultivated arts, and was carried to a wonderful degree of perfection. The scribes, who were generally, but not invariably, monks, were held in great respect by the people. The Irish books were not only finely written, but also ornamented in a fashion which was early perfected in Ireland. First, the initial letters were made larger, more elaborate, and more beautiful. Then they were surrounded with dots of color, and finally with delicately interlaced scrollwork, which was sometimes continued along the margin of the page. Decorated headpieces and tailpieces were added, in which leaves, the figures of animals and serpents, and sometimes even portraits of saints were mingled with the interlaced scrollwork. Many colors were used, red, green, pink, blue, and yellow, for instance, are employed in the illumination of the Book of Kales. So well were these colors made that after twelve centuries they have lost none of their original brilliancy. The Book of Kales was finished before the end of the seventh century and is, without doubt, the most perfect and most beautiful manuscript in the world. It is a Latin manuscript of the Gospels. The Book of Armagh, finished in 807, contains the Confession of St. Patrick, the Epistle to Coroticus, and a Life of the Apostle of Ireland. The Book of Duro, written about the same time as the Book of Kells, and the Book of MacDurnan, written shortly after the Book of Armagh, 
show the same admirable workmanship. End of section 86. This recording is in the public domain. Section 87 of England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The World's Story, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 87. How Brian Borrow Held the Ford of Tribute, 941, by E. S. Brooks. Into that picturesque and legend-filled section of Ireland, now known as County Clare, where, over rocks and boulders, the Shannon, noblest of Irish rivers, rushes down past Killaloe and Castle Connell to Limerick and the sea, there rode one fair summer morning many, many years ago a young Irish lad. The skirt of his party-coloured len, or kilt, was richly embroidered and fringed with gold. His inner, or jacket, close-fitting and silver-trimmed, was open at the throat, displaying the embroidered len and the torque, or twisted collar of gold, about his sturdy neck, while the purple scarf held the jacket at the waist. A gleaming golden brooch secured the long-played brat, or shawl, that dropped from his left shoulder, Broad bracelets encircled his bare and curiously tattooed arms, and from an odd-looking golden spiral at the back of his head, his thick and dark red hair fell in flowing ringlets upon his broad shoulders. Rawhide shoes covered his feet, and his bronze shield and short war axe hung conveniently from his saddle of skins. A strong guard of pikemen and gallow glasses, or heavily armed footmen, "'followed at his pony's heels, "'and seemed an escort worthy a king's son. "'A strong-limbed, cleanly-built lad of fifteen "'was this sturdy young horseman, "'who now rode down the Athna Baruma, "'or ford of tribute, "'just above the rapids of Shannon, "'near the town of Killaloe. "'And as he reined in his pony, "'he turned and bade his herald, Cogaran, "'sound the trumpet blast "'that should announce to the clan of Cass the return from his years of fosterage of the young Flyth or chieftain, Brian, the son of Kennedy, king of Thomond. But ere the strong-lunged Corgoran could wind his horn, the hearts of all the company grew numb with fear, as across the water the low, clear strains of a warning song sounded from the haunted grey stone, the mystic rock of Carrick Lee that overhung the trembling rapids. Quote, Never yet for fear or foe, by the ford of Killaloe, stooped the crests of heroes free, sons of Cass by Carrick Lee, falls the arm that smites the foe, by the ford of Killaloe, chilled the heart that boundeth free, by the rock of Carrick Lee. He who knows not fear of foe, fears the fort of Killaloe, fears the voice that chants his dree, from the rock of Carrick Lee. End quote. Young Brian was full of the superstition of his day, superstition that even yet lives amid the simple peasantry of Ireland, and peoples, rocks and woods, and streams with good and evil spirits, fairies, sprites and banshees, and no real native Irish lad could fail to tremble before the mysterious song. Sorely troubled, he turned to Cogaran inquiringly, and that faithful retainer said in a rather shaky voice, "'Tis your warning song, O noble young chief. "'Tis the voice of the banshee of our clan. "'Aobin, the wraith of Carrick Lee. "'Just then, from behind the haunted grey rock, "'a fair young girl appeared, "'tripping lightly across the large stepping-stones "'that furnished the only means of crossing the ford of Killaloe. "'See, see,' said Corgoran, "'grasping his young lord's arm. "'She comes for thee.' "'Tis thy doom, O master, the fiend of Carrickley. "'So fair a fiend should bring me naught of grief,' said young Brian, stoutly enough, though it must be confessed his heart beat fast and loud. 
O spirit of the waters, he exclaimed, O banshee of Clan Cass, why thus early in his life dost thou come to summon the son of Kennedy, the king? The young girl turned startled eyes upon the group of armed and warlike men, and grasping the skirt of her white and purple len, turned as if to flee, when Corgoran, with a loud laugh, cried out, Now, fool and double fool am I, fit brother to Citric the Blind and the Black King of Dublin. Why, tis no banshee, O noble young chief, tis but thy foster-sister, Emma, the daughter of Connor, Emma the golden-haired. Nay, is it so? St. Sinanus be praised, said Brian, greatly relieved. Cross to us, maiden, cross to us, he said. Fear nothing, tis but Brian, thy foster-brother, returning to his father's home. The girl swiftly crossed the ford and bowed her golden head in a vassal's welcome to the young lord. Welcome home, O oh brother, she said. Even now, my lord, thy father, awaits the sound of thy horn, as he sits in the great seat beneath his kingly shield, and I— And thou, maiden, said Brian gaily, thou must needs lurk behind the haunted rock of Carrickley, to freeze the heart of young Brian at his homecoming with thy banshee song? Aimer of the golden hair laughed a ringing laugh. Sayst thou so, brother? she said. Dost the scourge of the Danes shrink thus at a maiden's voice? Who calls me the scourge of the Danes? asked Brian. So across the border do they say that the maidens of King Callahan's court call the boy Brian the son of Kennedy, the girl made answer. Who faces the Danes, my sister? Tends no tender foe, said Brian, and the court of the King of Cashel is no lady's hall in these hard-striking times. But wind thy horn, Cogoran, and cross we the ford to greet the king, my father. Loud and clear the herald's call rose above the rush of the rapids, and as the boy and his followers crossed the ford, the gates of the palace, or dun, of King Kennedy of Thomond were flung open, and the band of welcomers, headed by Mahon, Brian's eldest brother, rode out to greet the lad. Nine hundred years ago the tribe of Cass was one of the most powerful of the many Irish clans. The whole of Thomond, or North Munster, was under their sway, and from them, say the old records, it was never lawful to levy rent or tribute or pledge or hostage or fostership fees. So strong and free were they. When the clans of Munster gathered for battle, it was the right of the clan of Cass to lead in the attack, and to guard the rear when returning from any invasion. It gave kings to the throne of Munster, and valiant leaders to warfare with the Danes, who, in the tenth century, poured their hosts into Ireland, conquering and destroying. In the year 948, in which our sketch opens, the head of this powerful clan was Kenedi, or Kennedy, King of Thomond. His son Brian had, in accordance with an old Irish custom, passed his boyhood in Fosterage, at the court of Callaghan, King of Cashel, in East Munster. Brought up amid warlike scenes, where battles with the Danish invaders were a frequent occurrence, young Brian had now, at fifteen, completed the years of his fostership, and was a lad of strong and dauntless courage, cool and clear-headed, and a firm foe of Ireland's scourge, the fierce Dub Gale, or Black Gentiles, as the Danes were called. The feast of welcome was over, the bards had sung their heroic songs to the accompaniment of the cruot, or harp. The fool had played his pranks, and the juggler his tricks, and the chief bard, who was expected to be familiar with more than seven times fifty stories, great and small, had given the best from his list, and as they sat thus in the Kumtek, or great hall, of the long low-roofed house of hewn oak, that scarcely rose above the stout earthen ramparts that defended it, swift messengers came, bearing news of a great gathering of Danes for the ravaging of Munster, and the especial plundering of the clan of Cass. "'Thou hast come in right-fitting time, O son,' said Kennedy the king. Here is need of strong arms and stout hearts. How say ye, noble lords and worthy chieftains, dare we face in fight this so great a host? 
but as chiefs and councillors were discussing the king's question, advising fight or flight as they deemed wisest, young Brian sprung into the assembly, war axe in hand. "'What, fathers of Canclass?' he cried, all aflame with excitement. "'Will ye stoop to parley with hard-hearted pirates? Ye, who never brooked injustice or tyranny from any king of all the kings of Erin, ye, who never yielded even the leveret of a hare in tribute to Leinsterman or Dane? Tis for the can of class to demand tribute, not to pay it. Summon our vassals to war. Place me, O king, my father, here at the ford of the tribute, and make me test of the lessons of my fostership. Know ye not how the boy champion, Cuchulin of Ulster, held the fort for five long days against all the hosts of Connaught? What boy hath done, boy may do. Death can come but once. The lad's impetuous words fired the whole assembly. The gillies and retainers caught up the cry, and, with the wild enthusiasm that has marked the quick-hearted Irishman from Brian's day to this, they all, so says the record, kissed the ground and gave a terrible shout. Beacon fires blazed from cairn and hilltop, and from the four points, from north and south and east and west, came the men of Thomond rallying around their chieftains on the banks of Shannon. With terrible ferocity the Danish hosts fell upon Ireland. From Dublin to Cork the coast swarmed with swordsmen. Across the fair fields of Meath and Tipperary, the smooth-plained grassy land of Erin, from Shannon to the sea, the kings and chieftains of Ireland gathered to withstand the shock of the invaders. Their chief blow was struck at Brocken's Break, in County Meath, and, on that field, says the old Irish record, fell the kings and chieftains, the heirs to the crown and the royal princes of Erin. There fell Kennedy, the king, and two of his stalwart sons. But at the ford of tribute, Brian, the boy chieftain, kept his post, and hurled back again and again the Danes of Limerick, as they swarmed up the valley of the Shannon to support their countrymen on the plains of Meath. The haunted grey stone of Carrickley, from which Brian had heard the song of the supposed banshee, rose sharp and bold above the rushing waters, and against it and around it Brian and his followers stood at bay, battling against the Danish hosts. Ill luck was it for the foreigner, says the record, when that youth was born, Brian, the son of Kennedy, in the very midst of the stubborn fight at the ford, and around from a jutting point of the rock of Carrickley, a light shallop came speeding down the rapids. In the prow stood a female figure, all in white, from the gleaming golden lan, or crescent, that held her flowing veil to the hem of her gracefully falling robe, and above the din of the strife a clear voice sang, quote, First to face the foreign foe, first to strike the battle blow, last to turn from triumph back, last to leave the battle's rack. Clan of Cass shall victors be when they fight at Carrick Lee. End quote. It was, of course, only brave young Ima of the golden hair bringing fresh arms in her shallop to Brian and his fighting men, but as the sun bursting through the clouds, flashed full upon the shining war-axe which she held aloft. The superstitious Danes saw in the floating figure the White Lady of the Rapids, the Banshee, a Oibin, the fairy guardian of the clan of Cass. Believing, therefore, that they could not prevail against her powerful aid, they turned and fled in dismay from the flowing river and the haunted rock. But fast upon young Brian's victory came the tearful news of the Battle of Brocken's Break, and the defeat of the Irish kings. Of all the brave lad's family, only his eldest brother, Mahon, escaped from that fatal field, and now he reigned in place of Kennedy, his father, as King of Thomond. But the victorious Danes overran all southern Ireland, and the brothers Mahon and Brian found they could not successfully face in open field the hosts of their invaders. So these two stout, able, valiant pillars, these two fierce, lacerating, magnificent heroes, as the brothers were called in the curious and wordy old Irish record, 
left their mud-walled fortress palace by the Shannon, and with all their people and all their chattels went deep into the forests of Cracklow and the rocky fastnesses of the county Clare, and there they lived the life of robber chieftains, harassing and plundering the Danes of Limerick and their recreant Irish allies, and guarding against frequent surprise and attack. But so hazardous and unsettled a life was terribly exhausting, and at length each party of them became tired of the other, and finally King Mahon made peace with the Danes of Limerick. But Brian the Brave would make no truce with a hated foe. "'Tell my brother,' he said, when messengers brought him word of Mahon's treaty, "'that Brian, the son of Kennedy, knows no peace with foreign invaders. "'Though all others yield and are silent, yet will I never.' "'And with this defiance the boy chieftain and the young champions of the tribe of Cass "'went deeper into the woods and fastnesses of County Clare, "'and for months kept up a fierce guerrilla warfare.' The Danish tyrants knew neither peace nor rest from his swift and sudden attacks. Much booty of satins and silken cloths, both scarlet and green, pleasing jewels and saddles, beautiful and foreign, did they lose to this active young chieftain, and much tribute of cows and hogs and other possessions did he force from them. So dauntless an outlaw did he become that his name struck terror from Galway Bay to the banks of Shannon, and from Lough Derg to the Baron of Clare. When he inflicted not evil on the foreigners in the day, the quaint old record asserts, he was sure to do it in the next night, and when he did it not in the night, he was sure to do it in the following day. One chill April day, as Brian sat alone before the gloomy cave that had given him a winter shelter in the depths of the forests of Clare, his quick ear, well trained in woodcraft, caught the sound of a light step in the thicket. Snatching his ever-ready spear, he stood on guard and demanded, "'Who is there?' No answer followed his summons, but as he waited and listened, he heard the notes of a song, low and gentle, as if for his ear alone. Quote, "'Chieftain of the stainless shield, prince who brooks no tribute fee, ne'er shall he to pagan yield, who prevailed at Caraclee. Rouse thee, arm thee, Hark and heed, Erin's strength in Erin's need. Unquote. Tis the banshee, was the youth's first thought. The guardian of our clan urgeth me to speedier action. Then he called aloud, Who sings of triumph to Brian the heavy hearted? Be no longer Brian the heavy hearted, be as thou ever art, Brian the brave came the reply, and through the parting thicket appeared not the dreaded vision of Aobin, the banshee, but the fair young face of his foster sister, Ima of the golden hair. "'Better days await thee, Brian, my brother,' she said. "'Mahon the king bids thee meet him at Holy Isle. None dared bring his message for fear of the death-dealing Danes, who have circled thee with their earthlines.' But what dare not I do for so gallant a foster brother? With the courtesy that marked the men of even those savage times, the boy chieftain knelt and kissed the hem of the daring little maiden's purple robe. And what wishes my brother, the king, O Ima of the golden hair? he said. Knows he not that Brian has sworn never to bend his neck to the foreigner? That does he know right well, replied the girl. But his only words to me were, Bid Brian, my brother, keep heart and keep this tryst with me, and the sons of Kennedy may still stand unfettered kings of Erin. So Brian kept the tryst. Near the southern shores of Lough Derg, the Holy Isle still lies all strewn with the ruins of the seven churches that gave it this name. The outlawed young chieftain met the king. Braving the dangers of Danish capture and death, he had come unattended to meet his brother. "'Where, O Brian, are thy followers?' King Mahon inquired. "'Save the fifteen faithful men that remain to me in the caves of Uim Bloit, said the lad. "'The bones of my followers rest on many a field, from the mountains of Connaught to the gates of Limerick, 
for their chieftain, O my brother, maketh no truce with the foe. Thou art but a boy, O Brian, and like a boy thou dost talk, said the king reprovingly. Thy pride doth make thee imprudent, for what thou hast gained since, spite of all, thy followers lie dead. Gained, exclaimed the young chieftain impetuously as he faced Mahon the king. I have gained the right to be called true son of the can of class, of ancestors who would brook no insult, who would pay no tribute fee to invaders, who would give no hostage, and as to my trusty liegemen who have fallen, is it not the inheritance of the can of class to die for their honour and their homes? demanded Brian. So surely it is no honour in valorous men, my brother, to abandon without battle or conflict their father's inheritance to Danes and traitorous kings? The unyielding courage of the lad roused the elder brother to action, and, secretly but swiftly, he gathered the chiefs of the clan for counsel in the dun of King Mahon by the ford of Killaloe. "'Freedom for Erin, and death to the Danes!' cried they. "'As the voice of one man,' says the record. Again the warning beacons flamed from cairn and hilltop. In the shadow of the Rock of Cashel, the royal sun burst, the banner of the ancient kings was flung to the breeze, and clansmen and vassals and allies rallied beneath its folds to strike one mighty blow for the redemption of Ireland. In the county of Tipperary, in the midst of what is called the Golden Valley, this remarkable Rock of Cashel looms up three hundred feet above the surrounding plain, its top even now crowned with the ruins of what were, in Brian's day, palace and chapel, turret and battlement, and ancient tower. Beneath the rough archway of the triple ramparts at the foot of the rock, and up the sharp ascent, there rode one day the herald of Ivor, the Danish king of Limerick. Through the gateway of the palace he passed, and striding into the audience hall, spoke thus to Mahon the king. Hear now, O king, Ivar, the son of Citric, king of Limerick, and sole overlord of Munster, doth summon thee, his vassal, to give up to him this fortress of Castle, to disperse thy followers, to send to him at Limerick, bounden with chains, the body of Brian the outlaw, and to render unto him tribute and hostage. King Mahon glanced proudly out to where upon the ramparts fluttered the flag of Ireland. Say to Ivar, the son of Citric, he said, that Mahon, king of Thomond, spurns his summons, and will pay no tribute for his own inheritance. And say thou too, cried his impetuous younger brother, that Brian, the son of Kennedy, and all the men of the clan of Cass, prefer destruction and death, rather than submit to the tyranny of pirates, and the overlordship of foreigners and Danes. Here then, Mahon, king of Thomond, Hear thou and all thy clan the words of Ivar, the son of Citric, came the stern warning of the Danish herald. Thus says the king, I will gather against thee a greater muster and hosting, and I will so ravage and destroy the can of class, that there shall not be left of ye one man to guide a horse's head across a ford, an abbot or a venerable person within the four corners of Munster, who shall not be utterly destroyed or brought under subjection to me. Ivar the king, tell thy master, said Mahon the king, unmoved by this terrible threat, that the can of Cass defy his boastful words, and will show in battle which are lords of Erin. And tell thy master, said his brother, that Brian the outlaw will come to Limerick, not bound with chains, but to bind them. The Danish power was strong and terrible, but the action of the two valiant brothers was swift and their example was inspiring. Clansmen and vassals flocked to their standard, and a great and warlike host gathered in old Cashel. Brian led them to battle, and near a willow forest, close to the present town of Tipperary, the opposing forces met in battle that lasted from sunrise to midday, and the sunburst banner of the ancient kings streamed victorious over a conquered field, and the hosts of the Danes were routed. From Tipperary to Limerick, Brian pursued the flying enemy, and capturing Limerick, took therefrom great stores of booty and many prisoners, 
and the queer old Irish record thus briefly tells the terrible story of young Brian's vengeance, a story that fittingly shows us the cruel customs of those savage days of old, days now fortunately gone forever. The fort and the good town he reduced to a cloud of smoke and to red fire afterward. The whole of the captives were collected on the hills of Sainegal, and every one that was fit for war was killed, and every one that was fit for a slave was enslaved. And from the day of Limerick's downfall the star of Ireland brightened, as in battle after battle Brian Borrow, footnote, Brian of the Tribute, and footnote, the wise and valiant young chieftain was hailed as victor and deliverer from sea to sea. Upon the death of his brother Mahon in the year 976, Brian became King of Thomond, of Munster, and of Cashel. Then, uniting the rival clans and tribes under his sovereign rule, he was crowned at Tara in the year 1000, Ardrai, or High King of Erin. The reign of this great King of Ireland was peaceful and prosperous. He built churches, fostered learning, made bridges and causeways, and constructed a road around the coast of the whole kingdom. In his palace at Kincora, near the old dun of his father, King Kennedy, by the ford of Killaloe, he dispensed a royal hospitality, administered a rigid and impartial justice, and so continued in prosperity for the rest of his reign, having been at his death thirty-eight years King of Munster, and fifteen years Sovereign of all Ireland. So the boy chieftain came to be King of Ireland, and the story of his death is as full of interest and glory as the record of his boyish deeds. For Brian grew to be an old, old man, and the Danes and some of the restless Irishmen whom he had brought under his sway revolted against his rule. So the grand old man of ninety years led his armies out from the tree-shaded ramparts of Royal Kinkora, and meeting the enemy on the plains of Dublin, fought on Friday, April the 23rd, 1014, near the little fishing station of Clontarf, the last and most terrible struggle of Northmen and Gael, of Pagan and Christian, on Irish soil. It was a bloody day for Ireland, but though the aged king and four of his six sons, with eleven thousand of his followers, were slain on that fatal field, the Danes were utterly routed, and the Battle of Clontarf freed Ireland forever from their invasions and tyrannies. End of section 87 This recording is in the public domain. Section 88 of England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Ireland, Part Two, Six Centuries of Oppression Historical Note The Norman barons who invaded Ireland in the twelfth century were only looking for plunder, but soon the discipline of their soldiers and the strong castles they built made them a power in the land. Throughout the thirteenth century Ireland was torn by the incessant struggle of Norman barons and Irish chiefs, but gradually the later comers mingled and intermarried with the natives until they became almost as Irish as the Irish themselves. The Tudor monarchs reasserted England's authority over Ireland and placed the country under English law. Irish chiefs were evicted from their estates, and the land was given to English settlers. Roman Catholics were excluded from all public offices and threatened with fine and imprisonment if they did not attend the Protestant church. The result of these and other tyrannical measures was a series of rebellions that were put down with the greatest cruelty. In 1641, the Irish seized the opportunity of the conflict in England between King and Parliament to take a bloody vengeance for their woes, and thousands of the English settlers were killed or driven from the country. Eight years later, Cromwell landed in Ireland with 18,000 veteran soldiers and subdued the country as it had never been subdued before. Under James II, the Catholics were given a share in the government. As a result, he found warm support in Ireland after he was driven from the English throne by William of Orange. In 1690, King William followed James to Ireland, and by his victory at the Boyne, that country was once more subdued. Severe laws were again enacted against Catholics, 
and the commerce and industry of the unhappy country were deliberately destroyed by a series of laws prohibiting exports and foreign trade. By the end of the eighteenth century, the limit of endurance was again reached, and another revolt ensued that was put down with difficulty. The only result of this uprising was the suppression of the Parliament at Dublin and the formation of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. End of section 88. This recording is in the public domain. Section 89 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 10. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 89. The House of the Geraldines by Justin H. McCarthy. By the beginning of the 14th century, the Normans of England had blended with the English, and the Normans of Ireland had blended with the Irish. England's only real authority in Ireland was over the district about Dublin, known as the Pale. In the effort to increase this authority, and to prevent the Normans and Irish from becoming one race, England passed the Statute of Kilkenny. By this statute, Normans were forbidden to speak the Irish language, and if a Norman followed any Irish custom or even wore the Irish dress, he was to forfeit his lands and suffer imprisonment. If he ventured to marry an Irish woman, the statute bade that his property should be forfeited and that he himself should be hanged, cut down, and disemboweled while yet alive. The most powerful of the Norman Irish families were the Geraldines, or Fitzgeralds, of Kildare, East Munster, the Butlers of Ormond, West Munster, and the Burks of Connaught. The Editor The story of the House of Geraldine is one of the most romantic in all Irish history. The Geraldines were descended from the two brothers, Maurice and William Fitzgerald, who came to Ireland at the heels of Strongbow. Through varying fortunes, at one time the whole house was nearly exterminated by McCarthy Moore. They had risen to a proud position of rule in Ireland. They owned all the broad lands from Maynooth to Lixna. Their followers swarmed everywhere, bearing a G on their breast in token that they owed their parts to the Geraldines. After Bosworth battle had placed Henry the Seventh on the throne of Richard of Gloucester, the new king was too busy with his kingdom to give much thought to Ireland. The English colony was in a bad way there. It was reduced to the county of Dublin, and parts of Meath, Louth, and Kildare. The greater part of the island was entirely in the hands of Irish chieftains, who exacted tribute from the English, and scornfully set at naught the continued and meaningless renewals of the statutes of Kilkenny. Henry at first left Ireland alone. He was ever content to leave the Geraldine control of the country unquestioned, although the Geraldines had been so defiantly Yorkist, and though not a few followers of the house had painted their own white roses red with their own blood on many an English field, they were Yorkist still. When Lambert Simnel came over to Ireland pretending to be the son of false fleeting, perjured Clarence, the Geraldines rallied round him with warm support and sympathy. When this image of a king was swept from the throne to the kitchen, Perkin Warbeck took his place, claimed to be the Duke of York, whom Gloucester had murdered in the tower, and he, too, found Geraldine aid and maintenance. Henry had now learned something of the strength of Irish disaffection in the hands of the Irish chiefs, and prepared to crush it out more subtly than by the sword. We have seen what the Irish Parliament was like a poor thing enough in itself, but at worst containing the principles of a representative system. This system Henry resolved to destroy. Three centuries had passed since the Norman banners had first floated over the Irish fields, and in all that time no attempt had been made to force the English laws upon the Irish sets, or to interfere with the self-government of the Norman settlers. Now in 1494, Henry sent over Sir Edward Poynings as Lord Deputy, 
with an army at his back to change altogether the relationship between the two islands poynings summoned a parliament at drogheda at which the famous measure known as poynings act was passed this act established that all english laws should operate in ireland and that the consent of the privy council of england was necessary for all acts of the irish parliament these measures at once deprived ireland of all claim to independent government henceforward she was to be the helpless dependent of the conquering country but the loss of liberty did not destroy the irish desire for freedom it rather gave it an additional incentive to action ireland being thus soldered close to england henry was content to leave the government of the country in the hands of, of its most powerful man all ireland men said was not a match for the earl of kildare then let the earl of kildare govern all ireland said henry the seventh and gave the rule of ireland into its hands he had been the most potent spirit in ireland under the old system to confirm his power under the new seemed to the astute henry the surest means of securing his alliance and the quiet dependence of ireland his successor the eighth henry looked on the geraldine power with grave jealousy the control of the island was practically in the hands of the earls of, of kildare and their followers and was drifting day by day farther from the control and supremacy of england what use were the statutes of kilkenny and poignings acts if the country was under the command of an anglo-irish house who defied the authority of england his jealousy of the geraldines was fostered by wolsey who was considerably under the influence of the house of ormond bitter enemies of the geraldines gerald the ninth earl son of henry the seventh's deputy was summoned to england he was at once thrown into the tower and false news of his execution was sent to dublin his son lord thomas fitzgerald silken thomas as he was commonly called by his people from the splendor of his dress displayed no silken spirit he raised at once a desperate revolt against the king but his forces were shattered by the english artillery brought thus into irish warfare for the first time he and his five uncles were compelled to surrender they were sent to london to the tower where the earl of kildare had died of a broken heart and they were all hanged at tyburn only one of their kin a boy of twelve a son of the earl of kildare by his second wife escaped from the slaughter of his race to rome to found again the fortunes of his house End of section seventy two this recording is in the public domain section ninety of england scotland ireland and wales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume ten england scotland ireland and wales edited by ava march taffin section number ninety the geraldines by thomas davis the geraldines the geraldines tis full a thousand years since mid the tuscan vineyards bright flash their battle spears when capet seized the crown of france their iron shields were known and their sabre dint struck terror on the banks of the garonne across the downs of hasting they spurred hard by william's side and the grey sands of palestine with moslem blood they died but never then nor thence till now had falsehood or disgrace been seen to soil fitzgerald's plume or mantle in his face the geraldines the geraldines tis in strongbow's van by lawless force as conquerors their irish reign began and oh through many a dark campaign they proved their prowess stern in Lannister's plains and munster's vales on kings and chief and kern but noble was the cheer within the hall so rudely won and generous was the steel-gloved hand that had such slaughter done how gay their laugh how proud their mien you'd ask no herald sign among a thousand you had known the princely geraldine these geraldines these geraldines not long our air they breathed not long they fed on venison and irish water seethed not often had their children been by irish mothers nursed when from their full and genial hearts an irish feeling burst the english monarchs strove in vain by law by force and bribe to win from irish thoughts and ways this more than irish tribe 
for still they clung to fosterage to brayon cloak and bard what king dare say to geraldine your irish wife discard ye geraldines ye geraldines how royally you reign o'er desmond broad and rich Kildare, and english arts disdained your sword made knights your banner waved free was your bugle call by glen's green slopes and dingle's tide from barrow's banks to Ugal. what gorgeous shrines what brayon lore what minstrel feats there were in and around maynooth's gray keep and palace filled adair but not for right or feast ye stayed when friend or kin were pressed and foemen fled when Kramaba bespoke your lance and rest ye geraldines ye geraldines since silken thomas flung king henry's sword on council board the english thanes among ye never ceased to battle brave against the english sway though axe and brand and treachery your proudest cut away of desmond's blood through women's veins passed on the exhausted tide his title lives a saxon churl usurps the lion's hide and though kildare tower haughtily there's ruin at the root else why since edward fell to earth had such a tree no fruit true geraldine brave geraldine as torrents mould the earth you channeled deep old ireland's heart by constancy and worth when ginkgo leaguered limerick the irish soldiers gazed to see if in the setting sun dead desmond's banner blazed and still it is the peasant's hope upon the curragh's mere they live we'll see ten thousand men with good lord edward here so let them dream till brighter days when not by edward's shade but by some leader true as he their lines shall be arrayed these geraldines these geraldines rain wears away the rock and time may wear away the tribe that stood the battle shock but ever sure while well, one is left of all that honoured race in front of ireland's chivalry is that fitzgerald's place and though the last were dead and gone how many a field and town from thomas court to abbey field would cherish their renown and men would say a valor's rise or ancient powers decline twill never soar it never shone as did the geraldine the geraldines the geraldines and are there any fears within the sons of conquerors for full a thousand years can trees and spring from out a soil bedewed with martyrs blood or has that grown a purling brook which long rushed down a flood but desmond swept with sword and fire by clan and keep laid low by silken thomas in his kin by sainted edward no the forms of century rise and in the irish line command their son to take the post that fits the geraldine end of section ninety this recording is in the public domain Section ninety one of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Vengeance of Cromwell, sixteen forty nine, by Oliver Cromwell. After the execution of Charles I in sixteen forty nine, Cromwell set out to subdue Ireland. One of the first of his operations was the attack upon Drogheda, or Treda. The following is part of his own account of what happened after his forces had made their way into the city. The men who were shipped to the Barbados were sold as slaves, a far worse fate than death. The Editor Divers of the enemy retreated into the Mill Mount, a place very strong and of difficult access, being exceedingly high, having a good graft, and strongly palisadoed. The Governor, Sir Arthur Ashton, and divers considerable officers being there, our men getting up to them, were ordered by me to put them all to the sword. And indeed, being in the heat of action, I forbade them to spare any that were in arms in the town. And I think that night they put to the sword about two thousand men, divers of the officers and soldiers being fled over the bridge into the other part of the town, where about a hundred of them possessed St. Peter's Church steeple, some of the west gate, and others a strong round tower next the gate called St. Sunday's. These being summoned to yield to mercy, refused whereupon I ordered the steeple of St. Peter's Church to be fired. The next day the other two towers were summoned, and one of which was about six or seven score, but they refused to yield themselves, 
and we, knowing that hunger must compel them, set only good guards to secure them from running away until their stomachs were come down. From one of the said towers, notwithstanding their condition, they killed and wounded some of our men. When they submitted, their officers were knocked on the head, and every tenth man of the soldiers killed, and the rest shipped for the Barbados. The soldiers in the other tower were all spared, as to their lives only, and shipped likewise for the Barbados. I am persuaded that this is a righteous judgment of God upon these barbarous wretches, who have imbrued their hands in so much innocent blood, and that it will tend to prevent the effusion of blood for the future, which are the satisfactory grounds to such actions, which otherwise cannot but work remorse and regret. The officers and soldiers of this garrison were the flower of their army, and their great expectation was that our attempting this place would put fair to ruin us, they being confident of the resolution of their men and the advantage of the place. End of section 91. This recording is in the public domain. Section 92 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 92. After the Rebellion of 1641. 1653 by mrs e m field this morning's sun rose very brightly there was not a cloud in all the sky and i was very glad for at all times i love sunshine and on sunday it seems only right to see it i dressed quickly and went down into the great hall singing as i went the great wolf dogs rose up from where they lay by the fire our turf fire that burns almost all the year round for we love the cheerfulness of it and came barking and fawning upon me dogs have a wonderful power of sympathy if one is sad they see it and are gentle in their demonstrations of affection but when one is glad they are glad too and show it with all their might as these good beasts did now ah bran ah rory i said but you must not forget your master pierce where is pierce good dogs at the mention of that name the dogs suddenly ceased their delighted capers turned their eyes from corner to corner of the room and whined piteously he is not here dear dogs i said and i know not how we have the heart to be glad when he is hiding and cromwell holds the land but i think it is just because everything has been so dark that i have the heart to be glad now because sad times always do give place to better in the end and so i think it must be soon with us the terrible avenger cromwell has ravaged to his heart's content it was sixteen forty nine when he landed in sixteen fifty our soldiers laid down their arms and last year of sixteen fifty two the parliament issued an act banishing those who had taken a leading part in sir phelim's revolt and with them strange companions in misfortune all the protestant hierarchy and dividing their lands among soldiers and others at their pleasure my father bore no arms in that rising because for many years he has been afflicted with partial numbness on one side of his body making him incapable of warfare strong man though he is yet we have little to fear i think therefore although indeed i think we have as little to hope thus i mused this morning in the great hall until my mother came in and my father followed her after them came servants bringing breakfast as many dishes and as heavy as in the days when the great hall was ever filled with guests and retainers as i trust it may be again but many a familiar face will never more be seen here the king of spain has a great army of irish swordsmen now and france and poland too are rich in those brave and fearless hearts what up with the birds my ethna said my father the long day is never long enough for the child and as i bent to kiss his hand he kissed my forehead and graciously gave me leave to sit down at once so soon as the meal was finished the servants brought mantles and we went down together to the church which we see from the windows of the great hall Darahine, our island church outside the house is a broad terrace beyond the terrace long slopes of emerald green grass descending to the lake that nestles among its wooded shores and bears on its breast a wooded islet or two 
on the right hand a long promontory juts out into the calm waters and on this the church is built blue hills close the view they might be the end of the world for all i care nothing is so dear to me as the lake in the woods and the fertile fields that stretch away left and right where the trees end the shore of the lake is a gay scene on sunday morning when the little bell rings for mass and the people come from far and near afoot or more commonly in their boats they are amphibious like the beavers and learn to swim as soon as they learn to run rowing moreover is very early learned our flat-bottomed cots are not easily overturned and even if a youngster should contrive to fall into the water he can swim like any fish and his clothing of homespun can easily be wrung out and dried up the lake came the boats as i stood waiting four oars the first thing that comes to hand will do a fire shovel a spade a narrow log for cutting turf a piece of board never were there such people as the irish for contrivance my father declares something is sure to be ready to hand and vogue la galere footnote come what may end of footnote i watch the crowd assembling some of the men in the old quilted jerkin which keeps the body warm at home and defends it in battle others in the wide and long mantles which cover many deficiencies some with bare feet others with thick brogues and in blue hose made from beginning to end by their wives who comb the wool and cart it spin it on their cheerful whirling wheels and knit it afterwards into those comfortable garments for the women their gowns were blue or else scarlet woven in the village loom they mostly carried their brogues and stockings if they came on foot they certainly did so pausing before they turned the last corner to put them on and so appear in full dress at the church door the husbands of the married women carried the brogues for their wives as well as their own being courteous at heart though lowly born some of the very well-to-do came on their cars with the two solid wooden wheels and the flat planking nailed above the axles the most elementary vehicle i suppose that ever was made one here and there had a wicker creel attached to it for use on market days another would have a rough wooden bench to form a seat for the passengers a few had bits of wood nailed along to form low sides a great convenience on weekdays when sand or gravel forms the load the women who came by boat sat in easy dignity upon low wooden creepies set in the stern of the flat-bottomed cots while the men-folk rode or punted with long poles some few solitary individuals came along in coracles of wicker work covered with hide from far and near they came as they might none stayed away except those who by very grievous infirmity were compelled even old age was not a hindrance for terence mcsweeney stout sturdy young fellow that he is carried his old grandmother on his back judy mcsweeney whose age no one accurately knows but who had had the great honour of being foster-mother to my father which proud post gives great dignity to the mcsweeney family and was bought by them as i believe for a great number of cows fifty at the least contributed by brothers and cousins all the members of judy's family as was the custom of that day it was one of those strangely still days which come in early autumn when nature seems to rest exhausted like a new-made mother all she could do has been done her harvests are golden her fruit is ripe her roses have blown her young birds are strong on the wing in perfect silence neither triumphant nor disappointed she seems to rest a while the first yellow leaves were dropping into the perfectly unruffled lake like fairy gold thrown to the care of the water sprites the sun was hot but the air had a pleasant crisp freshness commend me to happy september for a truly pleasant day many a kindly greeting passed between us and our people as my father sat on the chair that is always set for him outside the church door till the hour of nine strikes and he enters the well-filled house of god in their melodious gaelic the people wished us many more happy sundays and saints days and all other good things in this world and the next and ever a vein of poetry ran through their greetings i'm growing old teague i cannot expect much more sunshine said my father to whom teague rafferty had wished that many years of such sun as was shining now might be his but if the yellow sunbeams were gone from his lord's head protested teague the moon of his silver hair had only begun to shine at which my father laughed and said that it was strange that on my head there was no gold what wish could teague give to raven-haired ethna 
that every hair on her head may be a candle to light her to glory the pulse of our hearts said t and the hour of nine struck and we went into the chapel where father ambrose stood at the altar and celebrated the mass our people's warm hearts were deeply moved by the sacred rites they are eager alike in love and in hate in devotion they are vehement they sob oftentimes and beat their breasts and tears flow down many an old and wrinkled face not one word of the latin is understood by them it seemed to me almost strange that they should be so moved but as the emotion rose so it died away when the mass was ended with the scent of the incense and the sound of the chanting it passed away and a merry throng they were that streamed out into the sunshine again at the corner of the broad terrace in front of the castle windows is a great beech whose branches spread very widely and its top shoots far up into the sky a splendid tree it is and of great age and under the shelter of its spreading branches my father's great oaken armchair was set after mass then the people repairing to their boats and cars or fetching bundles which they had laid under the trees brought the offerings due from them as tenants a basket of fat cackling geese from one from another a tub of rich golden butter from the poorest eggs and honeycombs hares and pigeons or plump young ducks and chickens from the better to do a heifer or two or a few sheep which were driven up that the knight of laura might see that they were noble beasts and worthy of his acceptance pigs there were too in plenty the faithful friends of our cottagers cheaply fed as they are and easily tended you have brought me a fair offering friends said my father when all was spread before him only brian lynch has nothing how is that brian lynch stood with downcast face in the background he now came forward sadly long illness had sorely hindered him he said nevertheless he had brought some honeycomb if the knight would be pleased to take so poor an offering and he would gladly give labour over and above that which was required of him if only his lord would be pleased to forgive his shortcomings this time take the honeycomb back to your children brian said my father it may well be that they are hungry and come daily to the castle for a loaf brian ethna he added turning to me it may be that you can help brian lynch's children with some of the work of your busy needle is it so i could and i had promised so to do tears rushed to brian lynch's eyes he threw himself on the ground and kissed the hem of my father's mantle declaring that but for so good and patient a master he could not live or survive his misfortunes but now hope filled his heart again like sunshine that comes back in spring murtough fogarty said my father when brian had gone away joyful you are hiding yourself in the crowd and you also have brought me no offering how is this but when murtough would have sheltered himself under the same excuse which had so well profited brian lynch my father shook his head and frowned that is not true in your case and the excuse will not serve your turn murtough strong drink is the root of all your misfortunes that and idleness have i said truly the man hanging his head confessed that nothing could ever be concealed from the master so wise and discerning was he i give you three months grace murtough said the knight sternly if at the end of that time you bring me a due offering well if not you and your family must come and serve me without any wage but your food till all is worked for the sentence was meekly accepted and the men came again one by one to ask what free labour they should give until christmas my father's harvest had been brought in each man helping as he could for our hired servants were but few and this was customary now the turf for the great winter fires in the castle had to be drawn home and each man was required to give the use of his car and of his own hands for a greater or less number of days according to his ability this matter also was settled for each one with due care my friends said then my father is all just and right it is all just and right they answered and again he asked thinking of the changing times shall i do away with free labour and offerings in kind and bid you pay me rent as they do in england there was little doubt of the mind of the people as with one voice they entreated that he would never change the old customs spend me but defend me has ever been their motto nor have i any mind to do so but the times are changing and the newly come english ever demand their rent my father answered sadly 
and then he desired that all who had any case to bring before him should at once proceed at this several men stepped forward for the people will not if they can help it that is unless summoned to appear go before any of the english courts they come to my father with any dispute and abide gladly and willingly by his decisions have you the roll my father asked and a servant brought to him upon a velvet cushion the ancient roll of the brihan law which for so many and many a long year has been kept in our family and was formally expounded by the chief son brihan in presence of as many of the sept as could gather upon a hilltop above our shining lake with much vehemence each side in the first cause argued before my father the complainant accusing the other of a theft which was eventually brought home to him and he was commanded to pay an eric of two pounds ten shillings in english money or an ox a fine beast being valued at that sum to restore besides the valuables which he had taken certain ancient jewels and ornaments of gold and silver which had been preserved with almost religious care by the complainant the sentence was the heavier because the theft had been committed on the feast of assumption a serious aggravation according to our ancient law of the offence in england so i have heard they take a man's life for stealing a sheep such a law seems horrible to our people especially as the administering of it here has little comfort for them since here if the defendant be english it is ever reckoned answer enough to say that the plaintiff is a mere irishman on the next case there was conflict of evidence that very morning so the miller of r d declared lawrence Riley had crept into his mill and had abstracted a sack of flour in answer lawrence declared that he had not been there but far away could he prove it ay that he could he could call witnesses by the score to show that he had been in another place or in several other places if the knight of laura so desired nor was he one whit abashed when it was pointed out by the laughter that arose that his last answer had not been for his advantage my father turned to the miller you say you did not hear the thief the miller had heard no sound it was strange for he was certainly in the mill my father beckoned to one standing by take off his brogues it was done a pair of clean and neat blue hose appeared the hose next and lawrence's bare feet showed unmistakable traces of the miller's white dusty floor strong evidence truly for the plaintiff great was the triumph of the adversary great was the respect paid to the wisdom of the knight of laura lawrence himself though compelled to pay an eric seemed as much pleased as anybody it was a fine story to tell again and to be sure some one must pay the piper and now said my father having by a wave of the hand dismissed the attendant pleaders and returned the roll to its cushion on which it was at once carried into the castle we have done a good day's work let us have some play where is the cake and rory the piper rory with his pipes under his arm was to the fore in a moment girls in scarlet or blue skirts with kerchiefs neatly tied over their shoulders and perhaps another over their hair or a gay ribbon to tie it stepped forward readily enough and the young men no less readily mantles were even thrown aside by many of the elders and the piper's elbow was soon at work filling his pipes with a will meantime larry og came forth from the castle with a pipe ten feet long in his hands carrying high above his head on the point of it a round board on which was the cake a right good cake as i know well who helped to make it round the board was a thick wreath of michaelmas daisies and red berries and such field flowers as could still be found while on pegs at the very edge of the rosiest apples of the year were fixed set close to each other in a bright circle red cheek to red cheek then every lad choosing for himself alas they danced in a ring round about the cake which larry og held upright on its pike handle and a merry scene it was for rory piped and those who stood round encouraged the dancers to do their best for the cake seeing that the couple that held up longest would win it as a prize so the mirth grew greater and greater as one couple and another gave in with faces crimson as the apples till at last no one was left but teague o'rourke my brother pierce's foster brother and pretty nora ni houlihan who duly received the cake and the apples the cake they cut up and it vanished wonderfully fast then nora threw the apples and the young men scrambled for them and each one who was fortunate enough to get an apple presented it to some girl and got in return a kiss if he could but as often as not he only received a clout 
which was not an unmixed pleasure i should imagine as the arms of these fair ones were strengthened by haymaking and milking and other tasks that make firm muscles ah it was a merry day a comfortable meal was laid out upon the short grass in a green glade and there the people rested and ate and were glad and sang out old songs that have mostly a wail in them even if the words are gay and last of all tigo work sang a song of his own making or more probably of malachi our old harpers which made a silence fall upon the merry gathering as if a shadow passed over it for he sang of the grinnin dun the slow tree and by that name they call my brother pierce because his eyes are dark as the sloes and his hair is raven black as it clusters over his forehead in the ancient irish fashion of the coolin which we love and which the english hate and have long striven to abolish they were rude rhymes enough that teague sang but they went to our hearts as the finest melodies and most inspired words could hardly have done and this was his song my drinnin duns fairer than a soft summer day my drinnin duns breath is like the new mown hay and his smile magil more footnote my brightness of my heart in the footnote like the ray of the sun and the name they call him is the drinnin dun kushla makri footnote vein of my heart in the footnote is the rain falling dreary where thou art keeping guard toil worn and weary youth of the strong arm oh where art thou gone dwelling in the shade of the drinnin dun curse upon the sassenach footnote english in the footnote joy bless them never the hearthstone of hell be their pillow for ever god's red wrath shall leave them no rest neath the sun for all our hearts are breaking for my drinnin done teague cried my father i will not have that song sung i have said it before if you have a mind to sing sing songs that will give us the hearts of men and not a philaloo only fit for a woman and you he turned to the harper add at once a cheerful strain to the song since i doubt not that it is of your making and henceforth whoso sings it must sing the whole under pain of my anger ay but he can sing the curses twice over if he list he added under his breath thus adjured the old blind harper who sat shrouded in his long mantle a little apart from the gay crowd struck the chords of his harp and sang to the same melody but in a major key teague having passed after his first verse into a wild minor strain hark how the blackbird sings shula shula a room footnote come come my dear in the footnote slantha footnote a health in the footnote ma vorni my darling come soon for the snow melts away and the summer's begun when we see the first blossoms of the drinnin done there's hope here but you might have promised him to us a little sooner than the spring malachi said my father between sighing and smiling and he called upon any who were willing to come forth and dance again and you ethna my child take part in the sport and lead the handkerchief dance the knight of laura's daughter need bait no jot of her dignity but will add to her empire over the hearts of her father's people by joining in pleasure as in worship with them i needed no such argument to move to music is always a boundless pleasure to me do not all young and strong creatures find it so certainly a horse springs under the rider at the sound of cheerful music as if to live and move had all at once become a doubled pleasure but i linger too long over the story of this day we have lived through many a merrier after all rent day and patron day and st patrick's happy feast but this was the very last and i think i shall never forget anything that happened from morning till the night of it for as i was winding in and out with the best dancers present holding a silken kerchief and passing under it and back again in the various figures of the dance there was suddenly a stir among the crowd and rory stopped piping for half a dozen young gentlemen of the neighbourhood rode up and dismounted casting their reins to some of the lads standing by and themselves at once approaching my parents who comes here asked my father 
o loglin you are welcome and fitzgerald your father's son is always a cad milla deolfa footnote hundred thousand welcomes in the footnote here and the rest of you those that remained were not of family equal to his own i am pleased to see you be seated where you will on the grass beside me hold tea cushions for the o'loughlin and the son of hugh fitzgerald young fitzgerald was evidently too much disturbed in mind to answer this welcome as readily as he ought he stood upright holding a sheet of paper and seemed uncertain how to utter what he had to say what bashful cried my father whose patience to say truth is not so long as that of job's why man thou hadst ever the gift of the gab like a true irishman what is there in that half ounce of paper to turn thee as white as itself here give me there was silence while he read the paper which he had impatiently seized it was a slow business that reading or so it seemed to me for the perturbed faces of the young men led me to fear that evil news was contained on that plain white sheet a foot wide perhaps by two feet long printed on in fair black type with the official seal of ireland drawn above it was no wonder that my father rose without a word when he had finished and went straight indoors followed with eager anxiety by my mother while we all stood and looked after them dismayed for the paper was a proclamation of oliver cromwell declaring that from henceforth all estates and farms in the three provinces should belong to the english soldiers and adventurers and that the irish nation must go bodily children cattle and all across the shannon into the wilds of Connacht before the first of march of the next year under penalty of death if found out of that province or the county of clare after that date alas alas for us there is no blossoming of the drennan dun to check our sadness no spring following our long winter no dawn to end our dark night but only sorrow and sorrow and yet again sorrow end of section ninety two this recording is in the public domain section ninety three of england scotland ireland and wales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume ten england scotland ireland and wales edited by eva march tappan section ninety three the siege of londonderry sixteen eighty nine by thomas babington macaulay when the english finally lost all patience with king james the second they invited his daughter and her husband william of orange to become their sovereigns james fled but he did not give up hope of regaining his crown and a year later he landed in ireland with troops and money supplied by the king of france all ireland except ulster was on his side but ulster which had been taken from the irish catholic owners and given to english and scotch protestants declared for william derry or london derry was its most strongly fortified town and thither fled large numbers of the protestants to this town james with his french and irish forces now laid siege the editor may passed away june arrived and still londonderry held out there had been many sallies and skirmishes with various success but on the whole the advantage had been with the garrison several officers of note had been carried prisoners into the city and the two french banners torn after hard fighting from the besiegers had been hung as trophies in the chancel of the cathedral it seemed that the siege must be turned into a blockade but before the hope of reducing the town by main force was relinquished it was determined to make a great effort the point selected for assault was an outwork called windmill hill which was not far from the southern gate religious stimulants were employed to animate the courage of the forlorn hope many volunteers bound themselves by oath to make their way into the works or to perish in the attempt captain butler son of the lord mount garrett undertook to lead the sworn men to the attacks 
on the walls the colonists were drawn up in three ranks the office of those who were behind was to load the muskets of those who were in front the irish came on boldly and with a fearful uproar but after long and hard fighting were driven back the women of londonderry were seen amidst the thickest fire serving out water and ammunition to their husbands and brothers in one place where the wall was only seven feet high butler and some of his sworn men succeeded in reaching the top but they were all killed or made prisoners at length after four hundred of the irish had fallen their chiefs ordered a retreat to be sounded nothing was left but to try the effect of hunger it was known that the stock of food in the city was but slender indeed it was thought strange that the supplies should have held out so long every precaution was now taken against the introduction of provisions all the avenues leading to the city by land were closely guarded on the south were encamped along the left bank of the foyle the horsemen who had followed lord galmore from the valley of the barrow their chief was of all the irish captains the most dreaded and the most abhorred by the protestants for he had disciplined his men with rare skill and care and many frightful stories were told of his barbarity and perfidy long lines of tents occupied by the infantry of butler and o'neill of lord slain and lord germanstown by nugent's west meath men by eustace's kill their men and by kavanagh's carry men extended northward till they again approached the waterside the river was fringed with forts and batteries which no vessel could pass without great peril after some time it was determined to make the security still more complete by throwing a barricade across the stream about a mile and a half below the city several boats full of stones were sunk a row of stakes was driven into the bottom of the river large pieces of fir wood strongly bound together formed a boom which was more than a quarter of a mile in length and which was firmly fastened to both shores by cables a foot thick there could be no doubt that if londonderry fell the whole irish army would instantly march in irresistible force upon lough erna yet what could be done some brave men were for making a desperate attempt to relieve the besieged city but the odds were too great detachments however were sent which infested the rear of the blockading army cut off supplies and on one occasion carried away the horses of three entire troops of cavalry still the line of posts which surrounded londonderry by land remained unbroken the river was still strictly closed and guarded within the walls the distress had become extreme so early as the eighth of june horse-flesh was almost the only meat which could be purchased and of horse-flesh the supply was scanty it was necessary to make up the deficiency with tallow and even tallow was doled out with a parsimonious hand on the fifteenth of june a gleam of hope appeared the sentinels on the top of the cathedral saw sails nine miles off in the bay of loch foyle thirty vessels of different sizes were counted signals were made from the steeples and were turned from the mastheads but were imperfectly understood on both sides at last a messenger from the fleet eluded the irish sentinels dived under the boom and informed the garrison that kirk had arrived from england with troops arms ammunition and provisions to relieve the city in londonderry expectation was at the height but a few hours of feverish joy were followed by weeks of misery kirk thought it unsafe to make any attempt either by land or by water on the lines of the besiegers and retired to the entrance of Lauch foyle where during several weeks he lay inactive and now the pressure of famine became every day more severe a strict search was made in all the recesses of all the houses of the city and some provisions which had been concealed in cellars by 
people who had since died or made their escape were discovered and carried to the magazines the stock of cannon-balls was almost exhausted and their place was supplied by brickbats coated with lead pestilence began as usual to make its appearance in the train of hunger fifteen officers died of fever in one day the governor baker was among those who sank under the disease his place was supplied by colonel john mitchelburn meanwhile it was known at dublin that kirk and his squadron were on the coast of ulster the alarm was great at the castle even before this news arrived avaux had given it as his opinion that richard hamilton was unequal to the difficulties of the situation it had therefore been resolved that rosen should take the chief command he was now sent down with all speed on the nineteenth of june he arrived at the headquarters of the besieging army at first he attempted to undermine the walls but his plan was discovered and he was compelled to abandon it after a sharp fight in which more than a hundred of his men were slain then his fury rose to a strange pitch he an old soldier a marshal of france in expectancy trained in the school of the greatest generals accustomed during many years to scientific war to be baffled by a mob of country gentlemen farmers shopkeepers who were protected only by a wall which any good engineer would at once have pronounced untenable he raved he blasphemed in a language of his own made up of all the dialects spoken from the baltic to the atlantic he would raise the city to the ground he would spare no living thing no not the young girls not the babies at the breast as to the leaders death was too light a punishment for them he would rack them he would roast them alive in his rage he ordered a shell to be flung into the town with a letter containing a horrible menace he would he said gather into one body all the protestants who had remained at their homes between charlemont and the sea old men women children many of them near in blood and affection to the defenders of londonderry no protection whatever might be the authority by which it had been given should be respected the multitude thus brought together should be driven under the walls of london derrick and should there be starved to death in the sight of their countrymen their friends their kinsmen this was no idle threat parties were instantly sent out in all directions to collect victims at dawn on the morning of the second of july hundreds of protestants who were charged with no crime who were incapable of bearing arms and many of whom had protections granted by james were dragged to the gates of the city it was imagined that the piteous sight would quell the spirit of the colonists but the only effect was to rouse that spirit to still greater energy an order was immediately put forth that no man should utter the word surrender on pain of death and no man uttered that word several prisoners of high rank were in the town hitherto they had been well treated and had received as good rations as were measured out to the garrison they were now closely confined a gallows was erected on one of the bastions and a message was conveyed to rosen requesting him to send a confessor instantly to prepare his friends for death the prisoners in great dismay wrote to the savage livonian but received no answer they then addressed themselves to their countryman richard hamilton they were willing they said to shed their blood for their king but they thought it hard to die the ignominious death of thieves in consequence of the barbarity of their own companions in arms hamilton though a man of lax principles was not cruel he had been disgusted by the inhumanity of rosen but being only second in command could not venture to express publicly all that he thought he however remonstrated strongly some irish officers felt on this occasion as it was natural that brave men should feel and declared weeping with pity and indignation that they should never cease to have in their ears the cries of the poor women and children who had been driven at the point of the pike to die of famine between the camp and the city rosen persisted during forty-eight hours in that time many unhappy creatures perished but londonderry held out as resolutely as ever and he saw that his crime was likely to produce nothing but hatred and obloquy he at length gave way and suffered the survivors to withdraw the garrison then took down the gallows which had been erected on the bastion when the tidings of these events reached dublin 
james though by no means prone to compassion was startled by an atrocity of which the civil wars of england had furnished no example and was displeased by learning that protections given by his authority and guaranteed by his honour had been publicly declared to be nullities he complained to the french ambassadors and said with a warmth which the occasion fully justified that rosen was a barbarous muscovite melfort could not refrain from adding that if rosen had been an englishman he would have been hanged avaux was utterly unable to understand this effeminate sensibility in his opinion nothing had been done that was at all reprehensible and he had some difficulty in commanding himself when he heard the king and the secretary blame in strong language an act of wholesome severity in truth the french ambassador and the french general were well paired there was a great difference doubtless in appearance and manner between the handsome graceful and refined diplomatist whose dexterity and suavity had been renowned at the most polite courts of europe and the military adventurer whose look and voice reminded all who came near him that he had been born in a half savage country that he had risen from the ranks and that he had once been sentenced to death for marauding but the heart of the courtier was even more callous than that of the soldier rosen was recalled to dublin and richard hamilton was again left in the chief command he tried gentler means than those which had brought so much reproach on his predecessor no trick no lie which was thought likely to discourage the starving garrison was spared one day a great shout was raised by the whole irish camp the defenders of londonderry were soon informed that the army of james was rejoicing on account of the fall of enniskillen they were told that they had now no chance of being relieved and were exhorted to save their lives by capitulating they consented to negotiate but what they asked was that they should be permitted to depart armed and in military array by land or by water at their choice they demanded hostages for the exact fulfilment of these conditions and insisted that the hostages should be sent on board of the fleet which lay in Loch foil such terms hamilton durst not grant the governors would abate nothing the treaty was broken off and the conflict recommenced by this time july was far advanced and the state of the city was hour by hour becoming more frightful the number of the inhabitants had been thinned more by famine and disease than by the fire of the enemy yet that fire was sharper and more constant than ever one of the gates was beaten in one of the bastions was laid in ruins but the breaches made by day were repaired by night with indefatigable activity every attack was still repelled but the fighting men of the garrison were so much exhausted that they could scarcely keep their legs several of them in the act of striking at the enemy fell down from mere weakness a very small quantity of grain remained and was doled out by mouthfuls the stock of salted hides was considerable and by gnawing them the garrison appeased the rage of hunger dogs fattened on the blood of the slain who lay unburied round the town were luxuries which few could afford to purchase the price of a whelp's paw was five shillings and sixpence nine horses were still alive and but barely alive they were so lean that little meat was likely to be found upon them it was however determined to slaughter them for food the people perished so fast that it was impossible for the survivors to perform the rites of sepulture there was scarcely a cellar in which some corpse was not decaying such was the extremity of distress that the rats who came to feast in those hideous dens were eagerly hunted and greedily devoured a small fish caught in the river was not to be purchased with money the only price for which such a treasure could be obtained was some handfuls of oatmeal leprosy such as strange and unwholesome diet engenders made existence a constant torment the whole city was poisoned by the stench exhaled from the bodies of the dead and of the half-dead that there should be fits of discontent and insubordination among men enduring such misery was inevitable at one moment it was suspected that walker had laid up somewhere a secret store of food and was revelling in private while he exhorted others to suffer resolutely for the good cause his house was strictly examined his innocence was fully proved he regained his popularity and the garrison with death in near prospect thronged to the cathedral to hear him preach drank in his earnest eloquence with delight and went forth from the house of god with haggard faces and tottering steps but with spirit still unsubdued there were indeed some secret plottings a very few obscure traitors opened communications with the enemy but it was necessary that all such dealings should be carefully concealed none dared to utter publicly any words save words of defiance and stubborn resolution even in that extremity the general cry was no surrender and there were not wanting voices which in low tones added 
first the horses and hides and then the prisoners and then each other it was afterwards related half in jest yet not without a horrible mixture of earnest that a corpulent citizen whose bulk presented a strange contrast to the skeletons which surrounded him thought it expedient to conceal himself from the numerous eyes which followed him with cannibal looks whenever he appeared in the streets it was no slight aggravation of the sufferings of the garrison that all this time the english ships were seen far off in loch foyle communication between the fleet and the city was almost impossible one diver who had attempted to pass the boom was drowned another was hanged the language of signals was hardly intelligible on the thirteenth of july however a piece of paper sewed up in a cloth button came to walker's hands it was a letter from kirk and contained assurances of speedy relief but more than a fortnight of intense misery had since elapsed and the hearts of the most sanguine were sick with deferred hope by no art could the provisions which were left be made to hold out two days more just at this time kirk received a dispatch from england which contained positive orders that london dares should be relieved he accordingly determined to make an attempt which as far as appears he might have made with at least an equally fair prospect of success six weeks earlier among the merchant ships which had come to lauk for under his convoy was one called the mount joy the master makaja browning a native of london there had brought from england a large cargo of provision he had it is said repeatedly remonstrated against the inaction of the armament he now eagerly volunteered to take the risk of succouring his fellow-citizens and his offer was accepted andrew douglas master of the phoenix who had on board a great quantity of meal from scotland was willing to share the danger and the honour the two merchantmen were to be escorted by the dartmouth frigate of thirty-six guns commanded by captain john leake afterwards an admiral of great fame it was the thirtieth of july the sun had just set the evening sermon in the cathedral was over and the heart-broken congregation had separated when the sentinels on the tower saw the sails of three vessels coming up the foil soon there was a stir in the irish camp the besiegers were on the alert for miles along both shores the ships were in extreme peril for the river was low and the only navigable channel ran very near to the left bank where the headquarters of the enemy had been fixed and where the batteries were most numerous leake performed his duty with a skill and spirit worthy of his noble profession exposed his frigate to cover the merchantmen and used his guns with great effect at length the little squadron came to the place of peril then the mount joy took the lead and went right at the boom the huge barricade cracked and gave way but the shock was such that the mount joy rebounded and stuck in the mud a yell of triumph rose from the banks the irish rushed to their boats and were preparing to board but the dartmouth poured on them a well-directed broadside which threw them into disorder just then the phoenix dashed at the breach which the mount joy had made and was in a moment within the fence meantime the tide was rising fast the mount joy began to move and soon passed safe through the broken stakes and floating spars but her brave master was no more a shot from one of the batteries had struck him and he died by the most enviable of all deaths in sight of the city which was his birthplace which was his home and which had just been saved by his courage and self-devotion from the most frightful form of destruction the night had closed in before the conflict at the boom began but the flash of the guns was seen and the noise heard by the lean and ghastly multitude which covered the walls of the city when the mount joy grounded and when the shout of triumph rose from the irish on both sides of the river the hearts of the besieged died within them one who endured the unutterable anguish of that moment has told us that they looked fearfully livid in each other's eyes even after the barricade had been passed there was a terrible half-hour of suspense it was ten o'clock before the ships arrived at the quay the whole population was there to welcome them a screen made of casks filled with earth was hastily thrown up to protect the landing-place from the batteries on the other side of the river and then the work of unloading began first were rolled on shore barrels containing six thousand bushels of meal then came great cheeses casks of beef flitches of bacon kegs of butter sacks of peas and biscuit anchors of brandy not many hours before half a pound of tallow and three-quarters of a pound of salted hide had been weighed out with niggardly care to every fighting man the ration which each now received was three pounds of flour two pounds of beef and a pint of peas it is easy to imagine with what tears grace was said over the suppers of that evening there was little sleep on either side of the wall the bonfires shone bright along the whole circuit of the ramparts the irish guns continued to roar all night and all night the bells of the rescued city made answer to the irish guns with a peal of joyous defiance through the whole of the thirty first of july the batteries of the enemy continued to play but soon after the sun had again gone down flames were seen arising from the camp and when the first of august dawned a line of smoking ruins marked the site lately occupied by the huts of the besiegers and the citizens saw far off the long column of pikes 
and stand as retreating up the left bank of the foil toward stray bane so ended this great siege the most memorable in the annals of the british isles it had lasted a hundred and five days the garrison had been reduced from about seven thousand effective men to about three thousand the loss of the besiegers cannot be precisely ascertained walker estimated it at eight thousand men end of section ninety three this recording is in the public domain section ninety four of england scotland ireland and wales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume ten england scotland ireland and wales edited by eva march tappan section ninety four the battle of the boyne sixteen ninety by thomas babington macaulay a year after the siege of londonderry king william landed in ireland and at the river boyne his veteran soldiers met the untrained irish peasants in a battle that sealed the fate of ireland the editor it was still early in the day the king rode slowly along the northern bank of the river and closely examined the position of the irish from whom he was sometimes separated by an interval of little more than two hundred feet he was accompanied by schomberg ormond sydney solmes prince george of hesse coningsby and others their army is but small said one of the dutch officers indeed it did not appear to consist of more than sixteen thousand men but it was well known from the reports brought by deserters that many regiments were concealed from view by the undulations of the ground they may be stronger than they look said william but weak or strong i will soon know all about them at length he alighted at a spot nearly opposite to old bridge sat down on the turf to rest himself and called for breakfast the sumpter horses were unloaded the canteens were opened and a tablecloth was spread on the grass the place is marked by an obelisk built while many veterans who could well remember the events of that day were still living while william was at his repast a group of horsemen appeared close to the water on the opposite shore among them his attendants could discern some who had once been conspicuous at reviews in hyde park and at balls in the gallery of whitehall the youthful berwick the small fair-haired lauzon turquenel once admired by maids of honour as the model of manly vigour and beauty but now bent down by years and crippled by gout and overtopping all the stately head of sarsfield the chiefs of the irish army soon discovered that the person who surrounded by a splendid circle was breakfasting on the opposite bank was the prince of orange they sent for artillery two field pieces screened from view by a troop of cavalry were brought down almost to the brink of the river and placed behind a hedge william who had just risen from his meal and was again in the saddle was the mark of both guns the first shot struck one of the holsters of prince george of hesse and brought his horse to the ground ah cried the king the poor prince is killed as the words passed his lips he was himself hit by a second ball a six-pounder it merely tore his coat grazed his shoulder and drew two or three ounces of blood both armies saw that the shot had taken effect for the king sank down for a moment on his horse's neck a yell of exultation rose from the irish camp the english and their allies were in dismay solmes flung himself prostrate on the earth and burst into tears but william's deportment soon reassured his friends there is no harm done he said but the bullet came quite near enough coningsby put his handkerchief to the wound a surgeon was sent for a plaster was applied and the king as soon as the dressing was finished rode round all the posts of his army amidst loud acclamations such was the energy of his spirit that in spite of his feeble health in spite of his recent hurt he was that day nineteen hours on horseback a cannonade was kept up on both sides till the evening william observed with especial attention the effect produced by the irish shots on the english regiments which had never been in action and declared himself satisfied with the result all is right he said they stand fire well 
long after sunset he made a final inspection of his forces by torchlight and gave orders that everything should be ready for forcing a passage across the river on the morrow every soldier was to put a green bough in his hat the baggage and great coats were to be left under a guard the word was westminster the king's resolution to attack the irish was not approved by all his lieutenants schomberg in particular pronounced the experiment too hazardous and when his opinion was overruled retired to his tent in no very good humour when the order of battle was delivered to him he muttered that he had been more used to give such orders than to receive them for this little fit of sullenness very pardonable in a general who had won great victories when his master was still a child the brave veteran made on the following morning a noble atonement the first of july dawned a day which has never since returned without exciting strong emotions of very different kinds in the two populations which divide ireland the sun rose bright and cloudless soon after four both armies were in motion william ordered his right wing under the command of meinhardt schomberg one of the duke's sons to march to the bridge of slain some miles up the river to cross there and to turn the left flank of the irish army meinhardt schomberg was assisted by portland and douglas james anticipating some such design had already sent to the bridge a regiment of dragoons commanded by sir neil o'neill o'neill behaved himself like a brave gentleman but he soon received a mortal wound his men fled and the english right wing passed the river this move made lausanne uneasy what if the english right wing should get into the rear of the army of james about four miles south of the boyne was a place called dulic where the road to dublin was so narrow that two cars could not pass each other and where on both sides of the road lay a morass which afforded no firm footing if meinhardt schomberg should occupy this spot it would be impossible for the irish to retreat they must either conquer or be cut off to a man disturbed by this apprehension the french general marched with his countrymen and with sarsfield's horse in the direction of slain bridge thus the fords near old bridge were left to be defended by the irish alone it was now near ten o'clock william put himself at the head of his left wing which was composed exclusively of cavalry and prepared to pass the river not far above drogheda the centre of his army which consisted almost exclusively of foot was entrusted to the command of schomberg and was marshalled opposite to old bridge at old bridge had been collected the whole irish army foot dragoons and horse sarsfield's regiment alone excepted the meath bank bristled with pikes and bayonets a fortification had been made by french engineers out of the hedges and buildings and a breastwork had been thrown up close to the water-side turkenel was there and under him were richard hamilton and antrim schomberg gave the word solmes's blues were the first to move they marched gallantly with drums beating to the brink of the boyne then the drums stopped and the men ten abreast descended into the water next plunged londonderry and enniskillen a little to the left of londonderry and enniskillen Cayamo crossed at the head of a long column of french refugees a little to the left of Cayamo and his refugees the main body of the english infantry struggled through the river up to their armpits in water still farther down the stream the danes found another ford in a few minutes the boyne for a quarter of a mile was alive with muskets and green boughs it was not till the assailants had reached the middle of the channel that they became aware of the whole difficulty and danger of the service in which they were engaged they had as yet seen little more than half the hostile army now whole regiments of foot and horse seemed to start out of the earth a wild shout of defiance rose from the whole shore during one moment the event seemed doubtful but the protestants pressed resolutely forward and in another moment the whole irish line gave way turkenel looked on in helpless despair he did not want personal courage but his military skill was so small that he hardly ever reviewed his regiment in the phoenix park without committing some blunder and to rally the ranks which were breaking all round him was no task for a general who had survived the energy of his body and of his mind and yet 
had still the rudiments of his profession to learn several of his best officers fell while vainly endeavouring to prevail on their soldiers to look the dutch blues in the face richard hamilton ordered a body of foot to fall on the french refugees who were still deep in water he led the way and accompanied by some courageous gentlemen advanced sword in hand into the river but neither his commands nor his example could infuse valour into that mob of cow stealers he was left almost alone and retired from the bank in despair farther down the river antrim's division ran like sheep at the approach of the english column whole regiments flung away arms colours and cloaks and scampered off to the hills without striking a blow or firing a shot it required many years and many heroic exploits to take away the reproach which that ignominious rout left on the irish name yet even before the day closed it was abundantly proved that the reproach was unjust richard hamilton put himself at the head of the cavalry and under his command they made a gallant though an unsuccessful attempt to retrieve the day they maintained a desperate fight in the bed of the river with solmes's blues they drove the danish brigade back into the stream they fell impetuously on the huguenot regiments which not being provided with pikes then ordinarily used by foot to repel horse began to give ground Callumeau, while encouraging his fellow exiles received a mortal wound in the thigh four of his men carried him back across the ford to his tent as he passed he continued to urge forward the rear ranks which were still up to the breast in the water on on my lads to glory to glory schomberg who had remained on the northern bank and who had thence watched the progress of his troops with the eye of a general now thought that the emergency required from him the personal exertion of a soldier those who stood about him besought him in vain to put on his cuirass without defensive armour he rode through the river and rallied the refugees whom the fall of Cayumo had dismayed come on he cried in french pointing to the popish squadrons come on gentlemen there are your persecutors those were his last words as he spoke a band of irish horsemen rushed upon him and encircled him for a moment when they retired he was on the ground his friends raised him but he was already a corpse two sabre wounds were on his head and a bullet from a carbine was lodged in his neck almost at the same moment walker while exhorting the colonists of ulster to play the men was shot dead during near half an hour the battle continued to rage along the southern shore of the river all was smoke dust and din old soldiers were heard to say that they had seldom seen sharper work in the low countries but just at this conjuncture william came up with the left wing he had found much difficulty in crossing the tide was running fast his charger had been forced to swim and had been almost lost in the mud as soon as the king was on firm ground he took his sword in his left hand for his right arm was stiff with his wound and his bandage and led his men to the place where the fight was the hottest his arrival decided the fate of the day yet the irish horse retired fighting obstinately it was long remembered among the protestants of ulster that in the midst of the tumult william rode to the head of the enniskilleners what will you do for me he cried he was not immediately recognized and one trooper taking him for an enemy was about to fire william gently put aside the carbine what said he do you not know your friends it is his majesty said the colonel the ranks of sturdy protestant yeomen set up a shout of joy gentlemen said william you shall be my guards to-day i have heard much of you let me see something of you one of the most remarkable peculiarities of this man ordinarily so saturnine and reserved was that danger acted on him like wine opened his heart loosened his tongue and took away all appearance of constraint from his manner on this memorable day he was seen wherever the peril was greatest one ball struck the cap of his pistol another carried off the heel of his jack-boot but his lieutenants in vain implored him to retire to some station from which he could give his orders without exposing a life so valuable to europe his troops animated by his example gained ground fast the irish cavalry made their last stand at a house called plotten castle 
about a mile and a half south of old bridge there the enniskilleners were repelled with the loss of fifty men and were hotly pursued till william rallied them and turned the chase back in this encounter richard hamilton who had done all that could be done by valor to retrieve a reputation forfeited by perfidy was severely wounded taken prisoner and instantly brought through the smoke and over the carnage before the prince whom he had foully wronged on no occasion did the character of william show itself in a more striking manner is this business over he said or will your horse make more fight on my honour sir answered hamilton i believe that they will your honour muttered william your honour that half suppressed exclamation was the only revenge which he condescended to take for an injury for which many sovereigns far more affable and gracious in their ordinary deportment would have exacted a terrible retribution then restraining himself he ordered his own surgeon to look to the hurts of the captive and now the battle was over hamilton was mistaken in thinking that his horse would continue to fight whole troops had been cut to pieces one fine regiment had only thirty unwounded men left it was enough that these gallant soldiers had disputed the field till they were left without support or hope or guidance till their bravest leader was a captive and till their king had fled End of section ninety four this recording is in the public domain section ninety five of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone the wearing o the green seventeen ninety eight during the rebellion of seventeen ninety eight the famous wearing o the green began to be sung stopford a brook says that it is probably the finest street ballad ever written the editor oh paddy dear and did ye hear the news that's going round the shamrock is by law forbid to grow on irish ground no more saint patrick's day will keep his colour can't be seen for there's a cruel law agin the wearing o the green i met with napper tandy and he took me by the hand and he said how's poor old ireland and how does she stand she's the most distressful country that ever yet was seen for they're hanging men and women there for wearing o oh, the green and if the colour we must wear is england's cruel red let it remind us of the blood that ireland has shed then pull the shamrock from your hat and throw it on the sod and never fear twill take root there though underfoot is trod when law can stop the blades of grass from growing as they grow and when the leaves in summer time their colour dare not show then i will change the colour to i wear in my cobeen but till that day please god i'll stick to wearing o oh, the green end of section ninety five this recording is in the public domain section ninety six of england scotland ireland and wales 
Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Emmett's Grave by Justin F. McCarthy. Robert Emmett was the leader of the United Irish Men, an organization which was formed to bring about parliamentary reforms. Becoming revolutionary, he aided in causing the Irish Rebellion of 1798. Five years later, an uprising was led by Emmett, who was captured and put to death. The Editor There is a grave in Dublin, whose sad and silent stone, no name of him who sleeps beneath, no eulogy makes known, no prayer for the departed soul, no monumental bust, adorns the voiceless sepulchre that shrouds the marsh's dust. Tis the grave of Robert Emmett, it obeys the latest breath of his bidding to the country on the day he met his death. My epitaph he ordered, let no living finger trace, Till with the nations once again my country takes her place. But all who love their country love that melancholy grave, Where the gallant body moulders of the bravest of the brave. Tis a nobler bed for such a sleep, with its epitaph unsaid, than the proudest tomb men ever raised to the venerated dead. Ah, lover, soldier, patriot, the time will surely come when that mute slab that guards thy rest need be no longer dumb, and when the children of thy race shall feel the right to make a fitting epitaph for him who died for Ireland's sake. End of section 96. This recording is in the public domain. Section 97 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Harp That Once Through Tara's Halls by Thomas Moore. Tara, a score of miles from Dublin, was famous in early Irish history as a royal residence. The Editor The harp that once through Tara's halls The soul of music shed Now hangs as mute on Tara's walls As if that soul were fled. So sleeps the pride of former days, So glory's thrill is o'er, And hearts that once beat high for praise Now feel that pulse no more. No more to chiefs and ladies bright The harp of Tara swells, The chord alone that breaks at night Its tale of ruin tells. Thus freedom now so seldom wakes, The only throb she gives Is when some heart indignant breaks To show that still she lives. End of section 97 This recording is in the public domain. Section 98 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Hale. Ireland, Part 3. Ireland and Her People. Historical Note. Throughout the 19th century, the struggle for freedom was continued by various societies and parties. The United Irishmen, the Ribbon Society, the Young Ireland Party, the Fenian Society, the Land League, and others. Repression was answered by outrage, and the prospect for liberty seemed at times dark indeed. But slowly the long struggle against oppression began to bear fruit. In 1829, the right of Catholics to sit in Parliament was granted. Forty years later, by the efforts of Gladstone, the Episcopal Church in Ireland was disestablished. Another serious grievance was the land question. The land of the country was in the hands of a very few persons, and was rented by them annually, except in Ulster, 
A tenant who had improved his holding in any way usually had his rent raised, and if he was evicted, he received no compensation for any of his improvements. By the influence of Gladstone, the act of the three Fs, free sale, fair rent, fixity of tenure, was passed. In 1885, the government offered to lend the small farmers the money to purchase their farms for themselves by their making small payments to extend over a period of 49 years. Other acts have been passed with the same general aim. The most pressing question for a long time was that of home rule. That is a local legislature for the country, notwithstanding the threat of the Protestant province of Ulster to rebel rather than be governed by an Irish parliament. A home rule bill passed the House of Commons in 1914 and so became law. End of section 98. This recording is in the public domain. Section 99 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 99 the grand canal hotel by charles lever the following scene from a story by a famous irish novelist gives a vivid picture of the utter wretchedness to which a large proportion of the population of ireland had been reduced by the early nineteenth century the editor little does he know who voyages in a canal boat dragged along some three miles and a half per hour ignominiously at the tails of two ambling hackneys what pride pomp and circumstance await him at the first town he enters seated on the deck watching with a dutchman's apathy the sedgy banks whose tall flaggers bow their heads beneath the ripple that eddies from the bow now lifting his eyes from earth to sky with nothing to interest nothing to attract him turning from the gaze of the long dreary tract of bog and moorland to look upon his fellow-travellers whose features are perhaps neither more striking nor more pleasing the monotonous jog of the postilion before the impassive placidity of the helmsman behind the lazy smoke that seems to lack energy to issue from the little chimney the brown and leaden look of all around have something dreamy and sleep-compelling almost impossible to resist and already as the voyager droops his head and lets fall his eyelids a confused and misty sense of some everlasting journey toilsome tedious and slow creeps over his besotted faculties when suddenly the loud bray of the horn breaks upon his ears the sound is re-echoed from a distance the far-off tinkle of a bell is borne along the water and he sees before him as if conjured up by some magician's wand the roofs and chimneys of a little village meanwhile the excitement about him increases the deck is lumbered with hampers and boxes and parcels the note of departure to many a cloaked and frieze-coated passenger has rung for strange as it may seem in that little assemblage of mud hovels with their dunghills and their duck pools around them with its one slated house and its square chapel yet there are people who live there and stranger still some of those who have left it and seen other places are going back there again to drag on life as before but the plot is thickening the large brass bell at the stern of the boat is thundering away with its clanging sound the banks are crowded with people and as if to favour the melodramatic magic of the scene the track rope is cast off the weary posters trot away towards their stable the stately barge floats on to its destined haven without the aid of any visible influence 
he who watches the look of proud important bearing that beams upon the captain's face at a moment like this may philosophize upon the charms of that power which man wields above his fellow-men such at least were some of my reflections and i could not help muttering to myself if a man like this feels pride of station what a glorious service must be the navy watching with interest the nautical skill with which having fastened a rope to the stern the boat was swung round with her head in the direction from whence she came intimating thereby the monotonous character of her avocations i did not perceive that one by one the passengers were taking their departure good-bye captain cried father tom as he extended his ample hand to me we'll meet again in Locre i'm going on mrs carney's car or i'd be delighted to join you in a conveyance but you'll easily get one at the hotel i had barely time to thank the good father for his kind advice when i perceived him adjusting various duodecimo carneys in the well of the car and then having carefully included himself in the frieze coat that wrapped mrs carney he gave the word to drive on as the day following was the time appointed for naming the horses and the riders i had no reason for haste locre from what i had heard was a commonplace country town in which as in all similar places every newcomer was canvassed with a prying and searching curiosity i resolved therefore to stop where i was not indeed that the scenery possessed any attractions a prospect more bleak more desolate and more barren it would be impossible to conceive a wide river with low and reedy banks moving sluggishly on its yellow current between broad tracts of bog or callow meadowland no trace of cultivation not even a tree was to be seen such is shannon harbour no matter thought i the hotel at least looks well this consolatory reflection of mine was elicited by the prospect of a large stone building of some stories high whose granite portico and wide steps stood in strange contrast to the miserable mud hovels that flanked it on either side it was a strange thought to have placed such a building in such a situation i dismissed the ungrateful notion as i remembered my own position and how happy i felt to accept its hospitality a solitary jaunting car stood on the canal side the poorest specimen of its class i had ever seen the car a few boards cobbled up by some country carpenter seemed to threaten disunion even with the coughing of the wretched beast that wheezed between its shafts while the driver an emaciated creature of any age from sixteen to sixty sat shivering upon the seat striking from time to time with his whip at the flies that played about the animal's ears as though anticipating their prey banneger your honour lochre sir rowl ye over in an hour and a half is it partumna sir no my good friend replied i i stop at the hotel had i proposed to take a sail down the shannon on my portmanteau i don't think the astonishment could have been greater the bystanders and they were numerous enough by this time looked from one to the other with expressions of mingled surprise and dread and indeed had i like some sturdy knight-errant of old announced my determination to pass the night in a haunted chamber more unequivocal evidences of their admiration and fear could not have been evoked in the hotel said one he is going to stop at the hotel cried another blessed hour said a third wonders will never cease short as had been my residence in ireland it had at least taught me one lesson never to be surprised at anything i met with so many views of life peculiar to the land met me at every turn so many strange prejudices so many singular notions that were i to apply my previous knowledge of the world such as it was to my guidance here i should be like a man endeavouring to sound the depths of the sea with an instrument intended to ascertain the distance of a star leaving therefore to time the explanation of the mysterious astonishment around me i gathered together my baggage and left the boat the first impressions of a traveller are not uncommonly his best the finer and more distinctive features of a land require deep study and long acquaintance 
but the broader traits of nationality are caught in an instant or not caught at all familiarity with them destroys them and it is only at first blush that we learn to appreciate them with force who that has landed at calais at rotterdam or at leghorn has not felt this the flemish peasant with her long-eared cap and heavy sabot the dark italian basking his swarthy features in the sun are striking objects when we first look on them but days and weeks roll on the wider characteristics of human nature swallow up the smaller and more narrow features of nationality and in a short time we forget that the things which have surprised us at first are not what we have been used to from our infancy gifted with but slender powers of observation such as they were this was to me always a moment of their exercise how often in the rural districts of my own country had the air of cheery comfort and healthy contentment spoken to my heart how frequently in the manufacturing ones had the din of hammers the black smoke or the lurid flame of furnaces turned my thoughts to those great sources of our national wealth and made me look on every dark and swarthy face that passed as on one who ministered to his country's weal but now i was to view a new and very different scene scarcely had i put foot on shore when the whole population of the village thronged around me what are these thought i what art do they practise what trade do they profess alas their wan looks their tattered garments their outstretched hands and imploring voices gave the answer they were all beggars it was not as if the old the decrepit the sickly or the feeble had fallen on the charity of their fellow-men in their hour of need but here were all all the old man and the infant the husband and the wife the aged grandfather and the tottering grandchild the white locks of youth the whiter hairs of age pale pallid and sickly trembling between starvation and suspense watching with the hectic eye of fever every gesture of him on whom their momentary hope was fixed canvassing in muttered tones every step of his proceeding and hazarding a doubt upon its bearing on their own fate oh the heavens be your bed noble gentlemen look at me the lord reward you for the little sixpence that you have in your fingers there i'm the mother of ten of them billy cronin ye er honour i'm dark since i was nine years old i'm the oldest man in the town land said an old fellow with a white beard and a blanket strapped round him while bursting through the crowd came a strange odd-looking figure in a huntsman's coat and cap but both were so patched and tattered it was difficult to detect their colour here's joe your honour cried he putting his hand to his mouth at the same moment tally ho ye ho ye ho he shouted with a mellow cadence i never heard surpassed yow 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 he cried imitating the barking of dogs and then uttering a long low wail like the bay of a hound he shouted out hark away hark away and at the same moment pranced into the thickest of the crowd upsetting men women and children as he went the curses of some the cries of others and the laughter of nearly all ringing through the motley mass making their misery look still more frightful throwing what silver i had about me amongst them i made my way towards the hotel not alone however but heading a procession of my ragged friends who with loud praises of my liberality testified their gratitude by bearing me company arrived at the porch i took my luggage from the carrier and entered the house unlike any other hotel i had ever seen there was neither stir nor bustle no burly landlord no buxom landlady no dapper waiter with napkin on his arm no pert-looking chambermaid with a bedroom candlestick a large hall dirty and unfurnished led into a kind of bar upon whose unpainted shelves a few straggling bottles were ranged together with some pewter measures and tobacco pipes while the walls were covered with placards setting forth the regulations for the grand canal hotel with a list copious and abundant of all the good things to be found therein with the prices annexed and a pressing entreaty to the traveller should he not feel satisfied with his reception to mention it in a book kept for that purpose by the landlord i cast my eye along the bill of fare so ostentatiously put forth i read of 
rump steaks and roast fowls of red rounds and sirloins and i turned from the spot resolved to explore further the room opposite was large and spacious and probably destined for the coffee-room but it also was empty it had neither chair nor table and save a pictorial representation of a canal-boat drawn by some native artist with a burnt stick upon the wall it had no decoration having amused myself with a lady Cahir, such was the vessel called i again set forth on my voyage of discovery and bent my steps towards the kitchen alas my success was no better there the goodly grate before which should have stood some of that luscious fare of which i had been reading was cold and deserted in one corner it was true three sods of earth scarce lighted supported an antiquated kettle whose twisted spout was turned up with a misanthropic curl at the misery of its existence i ascended the stairs my footsteps echoed along the silent corridor but still no trace of human habitant could i see and i began to believe that even the landlord had departed with the larder at this moment the low murmur of voices caught my ear i listened and could distinctly catch the sound of persons talking together at the end of the corridor following along this i came to a door at which having knocked twice with my knuckles i waited for the invitation to enter either indisposed to admit me or not having heard my summons they did not reply so turning the handle gently i opened the door and entered the room unobserved for some minutes i profited but little by this step the apartment a small one was literally full of smoke and it was only when i had wiped the tears from my eyes three times that i at length began to recognize the objects before me seated upon two low stools beside a miserable fire of green wood that smoked not blazed upon the hearth were a man and a woman between them a small and rickety table supported a tea equipage of the humblest description and a plate of fish whose odour pronounced them red herrings of the man i could see but little as his back was turned toward me but had it been otherwise i could scarcely have withdrawn my looks from the figure of his companion never had my eyes fallen on an object so strange and so unearthly she was an old woman so old indeed as to have numbered nearly a hundred years her head uncovered by her cap or coif displayed a mass of white hair that hung down her back and shoulders and even partly across her face not sufficiently however to conceal two dark orbits within which her dimmed eyes faintly glimmered her nose was thin and pointed and projecting to the very mouth which drawn backwards at the angles by the tense muscles wore an expression of hideous laughter over her coarse dress of some country stuff she wore for warmth the cast-off coat of a soldier giving to her uncouth figure the semblance of an aged baboon at a village show her voice broken with coughing was a low feeble treble that seemed to issue from passages where lingering life had left scarce a trace of vitality and yet she talked on without ceasing and moved her skinny fingers among the teacups and knives upon the table with a fidgety restlessness as though in search of something there agoshla don't smoke don't now sure it is the ruin of your complexion i never see boys take to tobacco this way when i was young wished mother and don't be bothering me was the cranky reply given in a voice which strange to say was not quite unknown to me ay ay said the old crone always the same never mind in a word i say and maybe in a few years i won't be to the fore to look after you and watch you here the painful thought of leaving a world so full of its seductions and sweets seemed too much for her feelings and she began to cry her companion however appeared but little affected but puffed away at his pipe at his ease waiting with patience till the paroxysm was past there now said the old lady brightening up take away the tay things and you may go and take a run on the common but mind you don't be pelting jack moore's goose and take care of brian sow she is as wicked as the divil now that she is boneens after her ye hear me darlin or is it sick you are ach weera weera what's the matter with you corny ma boochel corny exclaimed i forgetful of my incognito i corny neither more nor less than corny himself said that redoubted personage as rising to his legs he deposited his pipe upon the table thrust his hands into his pockets and seemed prepared to give battle oh corny said i i am delighted to find you here perhaps you can assist me i thought this was a hotel 
and why wouldn't you think it is a hotel hasn't it a bar and a coffee-room isn't the regulations of the house printed and stuck up on all the walls ay that's what the directors did put the price on everything as if one was going to cheat the people and signs on it look at the place now ugh the haythens the turks yes indeed corney look at the place now glad to have an opportunity to chime in with my friend's opinions well and look at it replied he bristling up and what have you to say again it isn't it the grand canal hotel yes but said i conciliatingly a hotel ought at least to have a landlord or a landlady and what do you call my mother there said he with indignant energy don't bait corney sir don't strike the child screamed the old woman in an accent of heart-rending terror sure he doesn't know what he is saying he is telling me it isn't the grand canal hotel mother shouted corney in the old lady's ears while at the same moment he burst into a fit of most discordant laughter by some strange sympathy the old woman joined in and i myself unable to resist the ludicrous effect of a scene which still had touched my feelings gave way also and thus we all three laughed on for several minutes suddenly recovering himself in the midst of his cachinations corney turned briskly round fixed his fiery eyes upon me and said and did you come all the way from town to laugh at my mother and me i hastened to exonerate myself from such a charge and in a few words informed him of the object of my journey whither i was going and under what painful delusion i laboured in supposing the internal arrangements of the grand canal hotel bore any relation to its imposing exterior i thought i could have dined here no you can't was the reply and ye're not fond of herons and had a bed too nor that either av ye don't like straw and as your mother nothing better than that said i pointing to the miserable plate of fish wished i tell you and don't be puttin the like in her head sometimes she hears as well as you or me here he dropped his voice to a whisper herons is so cheap that we always make her believe it's lent this is nine year now she's fasting here a fit of laughing at the success of this innocent ruse again broke from corney in which as before his mother joined then what am i to do asked i if i can get nothing to eat here is there no other house in the village no divil a one how far is it to locre fourteen miles and a bit i can get a car i suppose ay if mary doonan's boy is not gone back the old woman whose eyes were impatiently fixed upon me during this colloquy but who heard not a word of what was going forward now broke in why doesn't he pay the bill and go away divil a farthing i'll take off it sure av ye were a rale gentleman ye'd be given a fit penny bit to the gossoon there that sarved ye never mind corney dear i'll buy a bag of marbles for you at banagher fearful of once more giving way to unseasonable mirth i rushed from the room and hurried downstairs the crowd that had so lately accompanied me was now scattered each to his several home the only one who lingered near the door was the poor idiot for such he was that wore the huntsman's dress is the locre car gone joe said i for i remembered his name she is your honour she's away is there any means of getting over to-night barn walking there's none ay but said i were i even disposed for that i have got my luggage is it heavy said joe this portmanteau and the carpet-bag you see there i'll carry them was the brief reply you will not be able my poor fellow said i ay and you on the top of them you don't know how heavy i am said i laughingly begorra i wish you was heavier and why so joe because one that was so good to the poor is worth his weight in gould any day i do not pretend to say whether it was the flattery or the promise these words gave me of an agreeable companion en route but certain it is i at once closed with his proposal and with a ceremonious bow to the grand canal hotel took my departure and set out for locre end of section ninety nine this recording is in the public domain section one hundred of england scotland ireland and wales this is a librivox recording 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume ten england scotland ireland and wales edited by eva march tappan section one hundred an irish school early part of the nineteenth century by gerald griffin the schoolhouse at glendalough was situated near the romantic river which flows between the wild scenery of drumgolf and the seven churches it was a low stone building indifferently thatched the whole interior consisting of one oblong room floored with clay and lighted by two or three windows the panes of which were patched with old copy-books were altogether supplanted by school slates the walls had once been plastered and whitewashed but now partook of that appearance of dilapidation which characterized the whole building along each wall was placed a row of large stones the one intended to furnish seats for the boys the other for the girls the decorum of mr lenigan's establishment requiring that they should be kept apart on ordinary occasions for mr lenigan it should be understood had not been favored with any pestilatian light the only chair in the whole establishment was that which was usually occupied by mr lenigan himself and a table appeared to be a luxury of which they were either ignorant or wholly regardless this morning mr lenigan was rather later than his usual hour in taking possession of the chair above alluded to the sun was mounting swiftly up the heavens the rows of stones before described were already occupied and the babble of a hundred voices like the sound of a beehive filled the house now and then a schoolboy in frieze coat and corduroy trousers with an ink bottle dangling at his breast a copy-book slate voster and reading-book under one arm and a sod of turf under the other dropped in and took his place upon the next unoccupied stone a great boy with a huge slate in his arm stood in the centre of the apartment making a list of all those who were guilty of any indecorum in the absence of the master near the door was a blazing turf fire which the sharp autumnal wind already rendered agreeable in a corner behind the door lay a heap of fuel formed by the contributions of all the scholars each being obliged to bring one sod of turf every day and each having the privilege of sitting by the fire while his own sod was burning those who failed to pay their tribute of fuel sat cold and shivering the whole day long at the farther end of the room huddling together their bare and frost-bitten toes and casting a long envious eye toward the peristyle of well-marbled shins that surrounded the fire full in the influence of a cherishing flame was placed the hay-bottomed chair that supported the person of mr henry lenigan when that great man presided in person in his rural seminary on his right lay a close bush of hazel of astonishing size the emblem of his authority and the instrument of castigation near this was a wooden stroker that is to say a large rule of smooth and polished deal used for stroking lines in copy-books and also for stroking the palms of the refractory pupils on the other side lay a lofty heap of copy-books which were left there by the boys and girls for the purpose of having their copies sought by the master about noon a sudden hush was produced by the appearance at the open door of a young man dressed in rusty black and with something clerical in his costume and demeanour this was mr lenigan's classical assistant for to himself the volumes of ancient literature were a fountain sealed five or six strong young men all of whom were intended for learned professions were the only portion of mr lenigan's scholars that aspired to those lofty sources of information at the sound of the word virgil from the lips of the assistant the whole class started from their seats and crowded round him each brandishing a smoky volume of the great augustan poet who could he have looked into this irish academy from that part of the infernal regions in which he has been placed by his pupil dante 
might have been tempted to exclaim in the pathetic words of his own hero sunt hic etiam sua premia laudi sunt lacrimi rerum et mentum mortalia tanga whose head was the first question proposed by the assistant after he had thrown open the volume at that part marked as the day's lesson jim naughton sir well naughton begin consther consther footnote construe end of footnote now and be quick at poor ascanius medes in wallabus acri gaudet equo iamque hos cursu iam creterit elos spumantemque dari go on sir why don't you consther at puer ascanius the person so addressed began but the boy ascanius medes in wallabus in the middle of the valleys gaudet rejoices exults aragal exults is a bether word gaudet exults acri equo upon his bither horse o oh, merther alive his bither horse inag era what would make a horse be bither jim sure tisn't of sour beer he's talkin rejoicin upon a bither horse dear knows what a show he was what raisin he had for it acri equo upon his meddlesome steed that's the construction jim proceeded acri equo upon his meddlesome steed yamque on now preterit he goes beyond outstrips acri preterit he outstrips hos these yamque illos and now those cursu in his course que and optat he longs very good jim longs is a very good word there i thought you were going to say wishes did anybody tell you that dickens a one sir that's a good boy well optat he longs spumantum aprum that a foaming boar dari shall be given wotis to his desires out fulwum leonum or that a tawny lion that's a good word again tawny is a good word better than yellow descendere shall descend monte from the mountain now boys observe the beauty of the poet there is great nature in the picture of the boy ascanius just the same way as we see young mr kiley of the grove at the fox chase the other day leading the whole of em right and left yamque host yamque illos and now mr cleary and now captain davis he outstripped in his course a beautiful picture boys there is in them four lines of a fine high-blooded youth yes people are always the same times and manners change but the heart of man is the same now as it was in the days of augustus but consther your task jim and then i'll give you and the boys a little commentary upon its beauties the boy obeyed and read as far as pretexit nomine culpum after which the assistant proceeded to pronounce his little commentary now boys for what i told ye them seventeen lines that jim naughton cuns through this minute contains as much as fifty in a modern book i pointed out to you the picture of ascanius and i'll back it again the world for nature then there's the incipient storm interia magno miseri murmure caelum incipit era don't be talkin but listen to that there's a rumblin in the language like the sound of comin thunder insequitur comista grandine nimbus do you hear the change do you hear all the s's do you hear em whistlin do you hear the black squall comin up the hillside brushin up the dust and dried leaves off the road and hissin through the threes and brushes and do you hear the hail drivin ather and spatterin the leaves and whitin in the face of the country comista grandine nimbus 
that i mightn't sin but when i read them words i gather my head down between my shoulders as if it was hailin atop o me and then the sight of all the huntin party dido and the Trojans and all the great court ladies and the tyrian companions scattered like cracked people about the place lookin for shelter and peltin about right and left heather and thither in all directions for the bare life and the flood swellin and comin thunderin down in rivers from the mountains and all in three lines et tyrii commitus possumet trajana uentus dandanisque nepos veneris diversa per agros tecta metu petieri ruant de montibus omnis and see the beauty of the poet fallen up the character of ascanius he makes him the last to quit the field first the tyrian comrades and the feminine race that ran at the sight of a shower as if they were made of salt that they'd melt under it and then the trojan youth lads that were used to it in the first book and last of all the spirited boy ascanius himself silence near the door spell uncum dido dux set trianus iandum deveniant observe boys he no longer calls him as of old pius aeneas only dux trojanus there's where virgil took the crust out of homer's mouth in the neatness of his language that you'd gather a part of the feelin from the very shape of the line and turn of the prosody as formerly when dido was askin aeneas concerning where he came from and where he was bound he makes answer est locus hesperiam grai cog nomine di cunt terra antiqua potens armas atque uberi glebi huc curses fuit and there the line stops short as much as to say just as i cut this line short and spaken to you just so our course was cut in going to italy the same way when juno is vexed in talking of the trojans he makes her spake bad latin to show how mad she is silence many in capto desistere victam nec passi italia tu quorum aver terri regum quippe vetor fatis palasne excurere classum arguam atque ipsos potuit submergere ponto so he laves you to guess what a passion she is in when he makes her lave an infinitive mood without anything to govern it you can't attribute it to ignorance for it would be a whole thing in erinus if juno the queen of all the gods didn't know a common rule in syntax so that you have nothing for it but to say that she must be in the very moral of a fury such boys as the art a poet's and the janius uh, languages but i kept ye long enough go along to your greek now as fast as ye can and rehearse and as for ye continued the learned commentator turning to a mass of english scholars i see one comin over the river that'll teach you how to behave yourselves as it is a thing ye won't do for me put up your virgils now boys and out with the greek and remember the beauties i pointed out to ye if ye haven't the luck to think of em yourselves the class separated and a hundred anxious eyes were directed towards the open door it afforded the glimpse of a sunny green and babbling river over which mr lenigan followed by his brother david was now observed in the act of picking his cautious way at this apparition a sudden change took place in the entire condition of the school stragglers flew to their places the impatient burst of laughter was cut short the growing bit of rage was quelled the uplifted hand dropped harmless by the side of its owner merry faces grew serious and angry ones peaceable the eyes of all seemed poring on their books and the extravagant uproar of the last half-hour was hushed on a sudden into a diligent murmur those who were most proficient in the study of the master's physiognomy detected in the expression of his eyes as he entered and greeted his assistant 
something of a troubled and uneasy character he took the list with a severe countenance from the hands of the boy above mentioned sent all those names he found upon the fatal record to kneel down in a corner until he should find leisure to hair them and prepared to enter upon his daily functions for the present however the delinquents are saved by the entrance of a fresh character upon the scene the newcomer was a handsome young woman who carried a pet child in her arms and held another by the hand the sensation of pleasure which ran among the young culprits at her appearance showed her to be their great captain's captain the beloved and loving helpmate of mr lenigan casting unperceived by her lord an encouraging smile toward the kneeling culprits she took an opportunity while engaged in a wheedling conversation with her husband to purloin his deal rule and to blot out the list of the proscribed from the slate after which she stole out calling david to dig the potatoes for dinner and so we too will leave the school end of section one hundred this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and one of england scotland ireland and wales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume ten england scotland ireland and wales edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and one the winning back of the land eighteen o eight to nineteen o three by charles johnston and corita spencer great as was the need for emancipation it was as nothing compared to the distress and suffering caused by the deplorable social and economic condition of the country the relations between landlord and tenant were worse than at any past time and every year brought new and heavier taxes instead of lessening the burdens which the people already bore each man in the long series of middlemen as well as the tenant and the landlord at the two ends of the series had to gain a profit from the same acre of land and no one was willing to spend money on improving the quality of the land if it be asked why the answer is simple the tenant held his land from year to year at the will of the landlord and if he made improvements and so increase the value of the land he would be called on to pay a greater rent or leave his holding the middlemen would not make improvements because whoever stood next above them in the scale of extortion would immediately have demanded a greater payment the landlord made no improvements because he was accustomed to think of himself as a man with rights and privileges and never as a man with duties and obligations the result was that a piece of land was allowed to go from bad to worse and was finally rented for an excessive sum to a peasant so poor that he could not improve it in any way and could barely make a starvation wage for himself and his family in england the landlord was the agricultural partner of his tenant investing large sums of money in improvements such as drains fences outhouses and so forth so that the value of the land steadily rose but nothing of the kind existed in ireland frequently whole towns were owned by one man who thus had it in his power to exact what rents he pleased at the time of the union the population of ireland amounted to about four and a half millions it now began to increase rapidly the landlords permitted and even encouraged extreme subdivision of land so that they might collect rents from as many tenants as possible the peasants came to grow potatoes more and more exclusively since this was the cheapest crop and that which most easily sustained life without further outlay it is recorded that often during this time the poor peasant would plant his potatoes at the proper season and then go off to england to work for some english farmer and so try to make a little money meanwhile his family was left almost penniless to beg or borrow he would come back in time to dig his potato crop in the autumn and in this way he could earn more than by growing corn and a variety of crops then we must not forget the innumerable taxes he had to pay and the repeated injustice he suffered at the hands of the middlemen and tax-gatherers it was nothing unusual for a peasant to be forced to pay rent twice over to different middlemen both claiming the same piece of ground and to have his cattle sold before his eyes if he resisted these demands all this was known to parliament or at least ought to have been known since it had all been graphically described by irish members 
but no notice was taken of it the question of the land was now the gravest which remained to be solved it involved the right to work the right to earn food for one's family the right to possess a home a ferment of agitation gradually spread through the country which culminated in the formation of the land league in eighteen seventy nine the inspirer of this movement was michael davitt but it owed much of its success to the commanding genius of charles stuart parnell the land league meant the organizing of a nation in defence of its rights and was far more effective than any armed rebellion its three immediate objects were fair rent fixed hold and free sale by fair rent it was meant that the rent to be paid by a tenant should not be fixed arbitrarily by a grasping landlord but should be justly decided by a court after examining the land and judging of its extent and fertility fixed hold meant that the tenant should be entitled to hold his farm in security without fear of eviction or extortion so long as he paid the fair rent decided on by the court free sale meant that the tenant was entitled to sell his interest in his farm to a new tenant that interest representing the capital he had invested in improving the farm in fencing draining clearing and building the land league represented the organized demand for these things and every detail of the question was made thoroughly clear to the peasants for of every part of ireland at great public meetings addressed by parnell and his lieutenants at first parnell had greatly doubted whether the irish people would take up the land question in a serious way do you think he asked one of the older patriots that the irish people will take part in an agitation for land reform i think replied the patriot that to settle the land question the irish people will go to the gates of hell from ireland the agitation spread to the united states an extensive organization was there formed which set itself the task of providing the sinews of war a parliamentary fund was collected and parnell was soon in a position to provide for his army of parliamentary followers who were thus able to leave their other occupations and devote themselves wholly to the work of reform parnell commanded a parliamentary party of eighty-six members and never was a party so well led and so finely disciplined following the example set by joseph bigger of making long speeches and raising technical obstacles parnell perfected the system of parliamentary obstruction he made it impossible for the english parliament to carry on its work before it had done justice to ireland meanwhile the political situation was rapidly changing in england the conservative government fell and gladstone was returned to power in eighteen eighty as the head of a strong liberal government the land league agitation had penetrated to every part of ireland and had aroused such strong feelings against extortion and injustice that acts of violence and outrage were frequent gladstone proclaimed the land league an unlawful body and its leaders including parnell were arrested and thrown into prison gladstone determined however to settle the question of the land as he had settled the question of the church in eighteen sixty nine he therefore drew up the famous land bill of eighteen eighty one which secured to the irish people the three objects that had been agitated for thirty years fair rent fixed hold and free sale a land court was established with power to hold sessions in every part of ireland to fix fair rents which were thenceforth called judicial rents and to decide on the value of improvements made by a tenant on his farm in order to secure him in the enjoyment of these improvements this was a splendid measure and the good it has done is incalculable the many evils had survived from the past and were destined long to survive a series of crops almost as bad as in the famine years had reduced the tenants to dire poverty and often to starvation yet the landlords insisted on exacting the full arrears of rent which they had arbitrarily imposed before the days of the land court the consequence was that acts of violence increased carried on chiefly by secret societies such as the moonlighters and the invincibles gladstone grew disgusted with the attempt to rule ireland by force and coercion and came to an agreement with parnell then in kilmainham jail under which he was to receive parnell's support in parliament in return for measures beneficial to ireland gladstone's ministry fell from power in eighteen eighty five and lord salisbury and the conservatives returned to office their policy was marked by two principles first steady opposition to the agitation of the land league and the lawlessness which followed in its wake and second an organized methodical and enlightened attempt to remove the causes of irish poverty and misery one by one they passed the first land purchase act in eighteen eighty five a measure to enable the tenants to buy their farms from the landlords and so to be rid of the exactions and the extortions of rent once and for ever 
the english government placed a sum of twenty five million dollars in cash at the disposal of the irish farmers who could borrow as much as they required to buy their farms at once they were to repay the government by instalments spread out over forty-nine years at the end of which time they would be absolute owners of the soil several thousand more tenants became owners and reduced the amount they had to pay yearly by about one-third this measure has worked admirably and the sense of security gained by the farmers has already begun to call forth the qualities of thrift industry and providence which the former conditions of land tenure in ireland had done everything to destroy arthur james balfour became chief secretary for ireland in eighteen eighty seven in this post he played two widely different roles first as the opponent of the irish party in the house of commons he was cool polite satirical and very determined second in ireland itself he sincerely and effectively studied the wants of the irish people and set himself to devise remedies to meet them the second land purchase bill was passed in eighteen eighty eight by which a second sum of twenty five million dollars was put at the disposal of irish tenants who wished to purchase their farms mr balfour also turned his attention to what are called the congested districts in the west of ireland the condition in these districts has been well described by t w russell one of the most gifted of the liberal unionists a great part of the crowded population of the western seaboard live subject to the most shocking conditions the land is in many places hardly worth cultivating the riches of the sea are not for these poor people they have no boats no capital the skill of the fishermen has ceased to be developed and even where the fish caught the market does not exist that is there are no means of transit thereto struggling for a wretched existence upon these arid patches of soil growing potatoes and little else feeding a pig and rearing a scarecrow of a calf this is the method by which thousands of human beings drag out a miserable existence balfour set himself to remedy this by extending a system of railways through the congested districts obtaining a grant of seven million dollars from parliament for that purpose in eighteen ninety one balfour went very much further he had been convinced by this time and had convinced his party that in land purchase lay the solution of the irish question he obtained a new advance from parliament this time for a hundred and seventy million dollars to be applied for the purchase of farms by the farmers he also formed the congested districts board which was charged with the duty of purchasing land under the purchase acts for the purpose of enlarging and consolidating farms of improving the breed of horses cattle and poultry aiding the fishing industry by erecting piers and boat slips by the supply of boats and fish curing stations and of developing agriculture and other industry thus a constructive period gradually replaced the work of confiscation which england had carried on in ireland during centuries the cultivators of ireland have for over a generation had an opportunity of buying back their lands by instalments more than six thousand tenants purchased their farms under the irish church act of eighteen sixty nine the land acts of eighteen seventy and eighteen eighty one each turned nearly a thousand tenants into proprietors the land purchase act of eighteen eighty five extended the same privilege to two thousand more the land purchase acts of eighteen ninety one and eighteen ninety six turned into owners of the soil no less than thirty seven thousand former tenants arthur james balfour became prime minister in nineteen o two with george wyndham a descendant of lord edward fitzgerald as chief secretary for ireland he decided to settle the irish land question once for all and as far as possible to sweep the irish landlords out of existence parnell had said when the irish landlords are as anxious to go as we are to get rid of them the land question will be practically solved wyndham saw that the time was rapidly approaching when this would be true through the operation of gladstone's land courts the rents had been twice lowered all over ireland a third settlement of these rents was approaching it has long been the custom in ireland to make the selling value of the land depend upon the rent in general land is sold for a sum of money equal to the rent for twenty years thus if the rent of a farm were a hundred dollars a year its selling value would be two thousand dollars in ireland this is expressed by saying that the land is sold at twenty years purchase if the land court reduced the rent to seventy-five dollars a year the selling value of the farm would fall to fifteen hundred dollars so much sheer loss to the landlord the irish landlords had now seen the value of their property shrink twice under the operation of the land courts a third shrinkage was rapidly approaching this gave wyndham his opportunity his new land purchase bill included two propositions first to put at the disposal of the irish tenants a sum of english money so large that practically every tenant in ireland could take advantage of it and second to induce the landlords to part with their farms by offering them a bonus equal to about one-eighth of the selling price of the land thus the tenant was able to buy cheap while the landlord sold dear 
both parties being in an extremely satisfactory position wyndham made it possible for the whole nation to buy back the land and for the first time in history a whole people undertook the work of national redemption on the instalment plan wyndham's bill became law and came into operation on november one nineteen o three a government report recently printed sheds a flood of light on the working of land purchase during the thirty-four years preceding wyndham's act it is found that though the land has always been the first care of the purchasing tenants the houses both dwelling and farm buildings have been very materially improved since they became owners of the soil in all the four provinces this is the general testimony new buildings have sprung up old ones have been repaired on some estates where the condition of purchased and non-purchased holdings can be contrasted it is found that while the houses on the former have been much improved on the latter they are in a very neglected state the middleman has been done away with subletting and subdivision are practically extinct tenants will no longer sell part of their farms i could well perceive says one of the english land inspectors the love that these people have for their little homes and how desperate must be their position before parting with them and purchase seems to make them cling to them even more than before not less favourable is the verdict as to the credit and solvency of the new purchasers it is increased all around as is testified to by local bankers and shopkeepers who are in a position to know best a very good symptom is the fact that these new landowners are chary of getting into debt and think twice before they borrow money even when their credit is good we can well see that a great moral change must accompany this steady material regeneration a feeling of safety is everywhere springing up in place of the paralyzing insecurity and doubt that prevail for generations a group of tenant purchasers in roscommon declare that since they have got a hold of the land they have not spared themselves in making improvements which will be their own for all time a parish priest in cavan says that purchase has brought peace the people are more industrious more sober and more hopeful as to their future prospects the police say that before purchase they found the people troublesome and unruly but now all is changed and quietness and order reign instead the tenant purchasers are full of supreme contentment at their altered situation a priest in fermanach says the people in his parish are more industrious now while the consumption of whisky has diminished by a third the evidence of these two ecclesiastics vividly recalls the words put in the mouth of the irish by sir r kane in eighteen forty four we were reckless ignorant improvident and idle we were idle for we had nothing to do we were reckless for we had no hope we were ignorant for learning was denied us we were improvident for we had no future we were drunken for we sought to forget our misery End of section one hundred and one this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and two of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox dot org by sarah hale an irish cottage photograph page five hundred and forty four this beehive cottage with roped roof is in county donegal and is apparently one of the better sort william elleroy kurtz thus describes one even humbler than this in what are known as the congested districts that is the barren regions in which the irish were forced to settle when their fertile lands were confiscated by the english he says the walls were of rude stones piled one on another without mortar and the roof was made of straw there was no floor but the earth no furniture but the hard wooden bench a table and a three-legged stool there was no window and the only light that there was came through the door which opened into a loosened barnyard where the filth was ankle-deep and the stench almost insufferable the government has for years been striving to induce families to leave these congested districts and remove to more fertile and less crowded parts of ireland in many cases the tenants are given farming implements seeds and aid in restocking their farms often comfortable houses are also provided at no higher rent than had been paid for wretched hovels end of section one hundred and two this recording is in the public domain
Section 103 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section number 103. The Irish People, 20th Century, by Catherine Tynan. I must warn you, before proceeding to write about the Irish people, that I have tried to explain them, according to my capacity, a thousand times to my English friends and neighbors, and have been pulled up short as many times by the reflection that all I have been saying was contradicted by some other aspect of my country people. For we are an eternally contradictory people, and none of us can prognosticate exactly what we shall feel what do under given circumstances whereas the englishman is simple he has no mysteries once you know him you can pretty well tell what he will say what feel and do under given circumstances you have a formula for him you have no formula for the irish the englishman is simple the irish complex the anglo-irish who stand to most english people for the irish have been grafted on to them the complexity of the irish without their pliability it makes perhaps the most puzzling of all mixtures and it may be the chief difficulty in a proper estimate of the irish character they will tell you in ireland that you have to go some forty or fifty miles from dublin before you get into irish ireland there are a many good irish in anglo-ireland usually in the humbler walks of life whence you shall find in dublin servants car drivers policemen newspaper boys and so on the raciness the vivacity the charm which in irish ireland is a perpetual delight dublin drawing-rooms are not vivacious nor are the manners gracious although the four courts still produce a galaxy of wit and dublin citizens buttonhole each other with good stories all along the streets roaring with laughter in a way that would be regarded as bedlam in fleet street get into irish ireland and the manners have a graciousness which is like a blessing i asked the way in ballyshannon town once the woman who directed me came out into the street and a little way with me and when she left me calling to me sweetly come back soon to donegal which left a sense of blessing with me all that day there was a certain curly-haired woolly who drove the long car from donegal to killy Beggs. i can see woolly yet helping the women on and off the car with their myriad packages can see the delightful grief with which he parted from us his shiny face of welcome when he met us again a fortnight later. To set against Woolley were the car drivers, who certainly are unpleasant if the whip money does not come up to their expectations. We say of such that they are spoilt by the tourists. Yet I remember some who were not spoiled by the tourists, although they were perpetually in touch with them. Boatmen and pony boys at Killarney, and a certain delightful guide whose winning gaiety was not at all merely professional thinking over my country people i say they are so-and-so and then i have a misgiving and i say but after all they are not so-and-so they are the most generous people in the world they enjoy to the fullest the delight of giving and what a good delight that is i pity the ungiving people you will receive more gifts in ireland in a twelvemonth than in a lifetime out of it the first instinct of irish liking or loving is to give you something the giving instinct runs through all classes if you sit down in a cabin and see an old piece of lustreware or something else of the sort do not admire it unless you mean to accept it for it will be offered to you not in the spanish way which does not expect acceptance but in the irish way which does i have many little bits of china given so usually the one thing of any consideration or value the donor possessed i once sought to buy an old china dish much flawed and cracked by hot ovens in a dublin hotel as much to save it from following its fellows to destruction as for any other reason the owner would not sell the dish but he offered it for my acceptance in such a way that i could not refuse when i go back to my old home the cottagers bring a few new laid eggs or a griddle cake for my acceptance i have a friend in an irish village whose income from an official source is ten pounds a year she has a cottage a few hens and enough grass for a cow when she can get one her gifts come at christmas at easter on st patrick's day 
and on some special private piece of my own eggs sweets flowers a bit of lace or a fine embroidered handkerchief and in times of illness a pair of chickens that is royal giving out of so little and i assure you that it blesses the giver as well as the recipient on the other hand the farmers grow thriftier and thriftier sir horace plunkett and men like him truly patriotic irishmen are showing them the way successive land acts lift them more and more into a position of security from one of precariousness they have more money now to put in the savings banks their prosperity does not mean a higher standard of living although that is badly needed it means more money in the banks that is all the irish are very like the french if the day should come when they should learn like the french to be thrifty and usurious i hope i shall not be there to see it better a thousand times better that they should remain royal wastrels to the end and yet we need not fear it still if you ask a drink of water at a mountain cabin in the poorest parts of ireland you are given milk and do not offer to pay for it lest you sink to the lowest place in the estimation of these splendid givers the hospitality is truly splendid there is a saying in ireland that they always put an extra bit in the pot for the man coming over the hill it is an unheard of thing that you should call at an irish house and not be asked if you have a mouth on you if your visit be within anything like measurable distance of meal time you will be obliged to stay for the meal in england when people are poor or comparatively so or feel the need of retrenchment they do not entertain it is almost the first form of retrenchment which suggests itself to the englishman whereas to curtail his hospitalities would be the last form of retrenchment to an irishman and you will be entertained generously and lavishly by people you know to be poor the englishman's different way of looking at the matter is no doubt partly due to the fact that he is a much more domestic person than the irishman and depends mainly on his family life for his happiness and pleasure now the french do not give hospitality at all outside the large family circle so that in that regard at least the irish will have a long way to travel before they touch with the french i've said that the irish are not domestic they are gregarious but not domestic the irishman depends a great deal on neighbors he has no such way of enclosing himself in a little fortified place of home against all the ills of the world as has the englishman irish mothers like irish nurses are often tenderly exquisitely soft and warm but the young ones will fly out of the nest for all that perhaps the art of making the home pleasant is not an irish art perhaps it is the gregariousness general and not particular at least general in the sense of embracing the parish and not the family to the young irish and a good many of their elders the home is dull they go off to america leaving the old people to loneliness because there is no amusement they do not make their own interests as the slower less vivacious nations do the rainy irish climate seems made for a people who would find their pleasures indoors but the irish will be out and about telling good stories and hearing them they are an artistic people with great traditions yet books or music or conversation will not keep them at home if they cannot have the neighbors in they will go out to the neighbors they are very religious and accept the invisible world with a thoroughness and simplicity of belief which they would say themselves is their most precious inheritance the celt is no materialist he does not love success or riches most of those whom he holds in esteem have been neither successful nor rich money is not the passport to his affections he ought never to go away and alas he goes away in thousands contact with a selfish money-getting materialism has power to destroy the spiritual qualities of the celt once he is outside ireland when he comes back a prosperous irish american he is no longer the celt we loved and he does come back that is one of his contradictions the home he had left behind because of its dullness the arid patch of mountain land the graves of his people call him back again at the moment when one would have said every bond with them was loosened end of section one o three this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and four of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox dot org by sonia wales part one 
Legends of Wales Historical Note When the Saxons invaded Britain in the 5th century, the inhabitants were driven to the westward and mingled with their kinsmen in Wales. The conquest of these kinsmen was slow, for they made a most determined resistance. The King Arthur of Tennyson's idols is thought to have been one of their leaders, as was also Cadwallon. In the 11th century, an English army overran Wales, but not until the days of William the Conqueror did any English ruler succeed in obliging the Welsh to recognize him as sovereign. This recognition was given most grudgingly, and in order to prevent these unwilling subjects from making raids upon the English territories, the land along the borders, or marches, was granted to Norman nobles, Lord's Marchers, as they were called, and there they built their strongholds. They were an independent folk, these marchers, but they held back the Welsh, and therefore they had to be endured. End of section 104. This recording is in the public domain. Section 105 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. King Arthur by Bessie Rayner Parks When good King Arthur ruled this land, he dwelt at Carleon upon Usk. He held it with an armed right hand, and drank red wine from dawn till dusk. How stalwart were the warriors then! In our time no such maidens are. King Arthur was the first of men the fairest dame queen guinevere when merlin waved his silver wand none dared dispute its awful spells on summer nights the moonlit strand was musical with fairy bells and all the knights in arthur's court made glorious that enchanted spot and who was first in every sport ah who was loved but lancelot how bright the armour which they wore when setting out at morning tide the silken banners which they bore by gentle hands were wrought and dyed and who shall rise and who shall fall when they the robber bands assail and whose pure hands shall duty call to seek and find the holy grail fair company of noble knights that ride in that mysterious land and celebrate your mystic rites with stainless sword in stainless hand ah where is carleon upon usk though somewhere in the south of wales the wanderer there at gathering dusk when dreaming o'er these ancient tales We'll hardly see such lovely dames, We'll hardly meet such noble men, Till bards and prophets prove their claims, And good King Arthur comes again. End of section 105 This recording is in the public domain. Section 106 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Canada. The World's Story, Volume 10. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 106. The Dream of Maxon Wledig from the Mabinogian. Mabinogian is a general term used for the old Welsh tales and romances. In the following tale, Maxon is that Maximus whom, in 383, his soldiers proclaimed Emperor of Rome. The Editor. Maxon Wledig was Emperor of Rome and he was a comelier man, and a better and a wiser than any emperor that had been before him. And one day he held a council of kings, and he said to his friends, I desire to go to-morrow to hunt. And the next day in the morning he set forth with his retinue, 
and came to the valley of the river that flowed towards Rome, and he hunted through the valley until midday. And with him also were two and thirty crowned kings that were his vassals. Not for the delight of hunting went the emperor with them, but to put himself on equal terms with those kings. And the sun was high in the sky over their heads, and the heat was great. And sleep came upon Max and Wiledig, and his attendants stood and set up their shields around him upon the shafts of their spears to protect him from the sun, and they placed a gold enameled shield under his head, and so Maxon slept. And he saw a dream, and this is the dream that he saw. He was journeying along the valley of the river towards its source, and he came to the highest mountain in the world. And he thought that the mountain was as high as the sky, and when he came over the mountain, it seemed to him that he went through the fairest and most level regions that man ever yet beheld on the other side of the mountain. And he saw large and mighty rivers descending from the mountain to the sea, and towards the mouths of the rivers he proceeded. And as he journeyed thus, he came to the mouth of the largest river ever seen. And he beheld a great city at the entrance of the river, and a vast castle in the city, and he saw many high towers of various colors in the castle. And he saw a fleet at the mouth of the river, the largest ever seen. And he saw one ship among the fleet, larger was it by far, and fairer than all the others. Of such part of the ship as he could see above the water, one plank was gilded, and the other silvered over. He saw a bridge of the bone of the whale from the ship to the land, and he thought that he went along the bridge, and came into the ship. And a sail was hoisted on the ship, and along the sea and the ocean it was borne. Then it seemed that he came to the fairest island in the whole world, and he traversed the island from sea to sea, even to the farthest shore of the island. Valleys he saw, and steeps, and rocks of wondrous height, and rugged precipices. Never yet saw he the like. And thence he beheld an island in the sea, facing this rugged land. And between him and the island was a country of which the plain was as large as the sea, the mountain as vast as the wood. And from the mountain he saw a river that flowed through the land and fell into the sea. And at the mouth of the river he beheld a castle, the fairest that man ever saw. And the gate of the castle was open, and he went into the castle. And in the castle he saw a fair hall of which the roof seemed to be all gold. The walls of the hall seemed to be entirely of glittering precious gems. The doors all seemed to be of gold. Golden seats he saw in the hall, and silver tables. And on a seat opposite to him he beheld two auburn-haired youths playing at chess. He saw a silver board for the chess, and golden pieces thereon. The garments of the youths were of jet-black satin, and chaplets of ruddy gold bound their hair, whereon were sparkling jewels of great price, rubies and gems alternately with imperial stones. Buskins of new cordovan leather were on their feet, fastened by slides of red gold. And beside a pillar in the hall, he saw a hoary-headed man, in a chair of ivory, with the figures of two eagles of ruddy gold thereon. Bracelets of gold were upon his arms, and many rings upon his hands, and a golden torquoise about his neck, and his hair was bound with a golden diadem. He was of powerful aspect. The chessboard of gold was before him, and a rod of gold and a steel file in his hand and he was carving out chessmen. And he saw a maiden sitting before him in a chair of ruddy gold. Not more easy than to gaze upon the sun when brightest was it to look upon her by reason of her beauty. A vest of white silk was upon the maiden, with clasps of red gold at the breast, and a surcoat of gold tissue was upon her, and a frontlet of red gold upon her head, and rubies and gems were in the frontlet, alternating with pearls and imperial stones, 
and a girdle of ruddy gold was around her. She was the fairest sight that man ever beheld. The maiden arose from her chair before him, and he threw his arms about the neck of the maiden, and they two sat down together in the chair of gold, and the chair was not less roomy for them both than for the maiden alone. And as he had his arms about the maiden's neck, and his cheek by her cheek, behold, through the chafing of the dogs at their leashing, and the clashing of the shields as they struck against each other, and the beating together of the shafts of the spears, and the neighing of the horses and their prancing, the emperor awoke. And when he awoke, nor spirit nor existence was left him, because of the maiden whom he had seen in his sleep, for the love of the maiden pervaded his whole frame. Then his household spake upon him, Lord, said they, is it not past the time for thee to take thy food? Whereupon the emperor mounted his palfrey, the saddest man that mortal ever saw, and went forth towards Rome. And thus he was during the space of a week. When they of the household went to drink wine and mead out of golden vessels, he went not with any of them. When they went to listen to songs and tales, he went not with them there. Neither could he be persuaded to do anything but sleep. And as often as he slept, he beheld in his dreams the maiden he loved best. But except when he slept, he saw nothing of her, for he knew not where in the world she was. One day the page of the chamber spake unto him. Now, although he was page of the chamber, he was king of the Romans. Lord, said he, all thy people revile thee. Wherefore do they revile me? asked the emperor because they can get neither message nor answer from thee as men should have from their lord. This is the cause why thou art spoken evil of. Youth, said the emperor, do thou bring unto me the wise men of Rome, and I will tell them why I am so sorrowful. Then the wise men of Rome were brought to the emperor, and he spake to them. Sages of Rome, said he, I have seen a dream, and in the dream I beheld a maiden, and because of the maiden is there neither life nor spirit nor existence within me. Lord, they answered, since thou judgest us worthy to counsel thee, we will give thee counsel. And this is our counsel, that thou send messengers for three years to the three parts of the world to seek for thy dream. And as thou knowest not what day or what night good news may come to thee, the hope thereof will support thee. So the messengers journeyed for the space of a year, wandering about the world, and seeking tidings concerning his dream. But when they came back at the end of the year, they knew not one word more than they did the day they set forth. And then was the emperor exceedingly sorrowful, for he thought that he should never have tidings of her whom best he loved. Then spoke the king of the Romans unto the emperor, Lord, said he, Go forth to hunt by the way that thou didst seem to go, whether it were to the east or to the west. So the emperor went forth to hunt, and he came to the bank of the river. Behold, said he, this is where I was when I saw the dream, and I went towards the source of the river westward. And thereupon thirteen messengers of the emperors set forth, and before them they saw a high mountain, which seemed to them to touch the sky. Now this was the guise in which the messengers journeyed. One sleeve was on the cap of each of them in front, as a sign that they were messengers, in order that through what hostile land soever they might pass, no harm might be done them. And when they were come over this mountain, they beheld vast plains, and large rivers flowing therethrough. Behold, said they, the land which our master saw. And they went along the mouths of the rivers, until they came to the mighty river which they saw flowing to the sea, and the vast city, and the many-colored high towers of the castle. They saw the largest fleet in the world in the harbor of the river, and one ship that was larger than any of the others. Behold again, said they, the dream that our master saw. And in the great ship they crossed the sea, and came to the island of Britain and they traversed the island until they came to Snowdon. Behold, said they, the rugged land that our master saw. And they went forward until they saw Anglesley before them, 
and until they saw Arvon likewise. Behold, said they, the land our master saw in his sleep. And they saw Eber saying, and a castle at the mouth of the river. The portal of the castle saw they open, and into the castle they went, and they saw a hall in the castle. Then said they, Behold, the hall which he saw in his sleep. They went into the hall, and they beheld two youths playing at chess on the golden bench. And they beheld the hoary-headed man beside the pillar, in the ivory chair carving chessmen. And they beheld the maiden sitting on a chair of ruddy gold. The messengers bent down upon their knees. Empress of Rome, all hail! Ha, gentles, said the maiden, ye bear the seeming of honorable men, and the badge of envoys. What mockery is this ye do to me? We mock thee not, lady, but the emperor of Rome hath seen thee in his sleep, and he has neither life nor spirit left because of thee. Thou shalt have of us therefore the choice, lady, whether thou wilt go with us and be made empress of Rome, or that the emperor come hither and take thee for his wife. Ha, lords, said the maiden, I will not deny what ye say, neither will I believe it too well. If the emperor love me, let him come here to seek me. And by day and night the messengers hide them back. And when their horses failed, they bought other fresh ones. And when they came to Rome, they saluted the emperor and asked their boon, which was given to them according as they named it. We will be thy guides, Lord, said they over sea and over land, to the place where is the woman whom best thou lovest, for we know her name, and her kindred, and her race. And immediately the emperor set forth with his army, and these men were his guides. Toward the island of Britain they went over the sea and the deep, and he conquered the island from Beli, the son of Manigan, and his sons, and drove them to the sea, and went forward even unto Arvon, and the emperor knew the land when he saw it, and when he beheld the castle of Abersane, Look yonder, said he, there is the castle wherein I saw the damsel whom I best love. And he went forward into the castle and into the hall, and there he saw Kynan, the son of Yudav, and Adion, the son of Yudav, playing at chess. And he saw Yudav, the son of Caradoc, sitting on a chair of ivory carving chessmen. And the maiden whom he had beheld in his sleep, he saw sitting on a chair of gold. Empress of Rome, said he, all hail. And the emperor threw his arms about her neck, and that night she became his bride. End of section 106. This recording is in the public domain. Section 107 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 107 beth gilert or the grave of the greyhound about twelve twenty by william robert spencer the llewellyn whose hasty temper was the death of his faithful dog was llewellyn op your ward or llewellyn the great he brought both norman barons and welsh chieftains under his rule and gave valiant assistance to the barons in their struggle to force king john to sign magna carta unluckily for the probability of the story of gelert tales greatly similar to this have been found in russian sanskrit arabian and many other languages the welsh version has been handed down by tradition for seven hundred years and is generally received throughout wales of the so-called tomb of gelert george burrow says the tomb or what is said to be the tomb of gelert stands in a beautiful meadow just below the precipitous side of Kerichlan. it consists of a large slab lying on its side and two upright stones it is shaded by a weeping willow 
and is surrounded by a hexagonal paling who is there acquainted with the legend whether he believes that the dog lies beneath those stones or not can visit them without exclaiming with a sigh poor galert the editor the spearman heard the bugle sound and cheerily smiled the morn and many a brock and many a hound obeyed llewellyn's horn and still he blew a louder blast and gave a lustier cheer come glaert come where it never last llewellyn's horn to hear o oh, where doth faithful glaert roam the flower of all his race so true so brave a lamb at home a lion in the chase twas only at llewellyn's board the faithful glaert fed he watched he served he cheered his lord and sentinelled his bed in sooth he was a peerless hound the gift of royal john but now no gerlert could be found and all the chase rode on and now as o'er the rocks and dells the gallant chidings rise all snowdon's craggy chaos yells the many mingled cries that day llewellyn little loved the chase of heart and hair and scant and small the booty proved for gerlert was not there unpleased llewellyn homeward hied when near the portal seat his truant gellert he espied bounding his lord to greet but when he gained his castle door aghast the chieftain stood the hound all o'er was smeared with gore his lips his fangs ran blood llewellyn gazed with fierce surprise unused such looks to meet his favourite checked his joyful guise and crouched and licked his feet onward in haste llewellyn passed and on went gellert too and still where'er his eyes he cast fresh blood gouts shocked his view or turned his infant's bed he found with blood stained covert rent and all around the walls and ground with recent blood besprent he called his child no voice replied he searched with terror wild blood blood he found on every side but nowhere found his child hell hound my child's by thee devoured the frantic father cried and to the hilt his vengeful sword he plunged in gellert's side his suppliant looks as prone he fell no pity could impart but still his gellert's dying yell passed heavy o'er his heart aroused by gellert's dying yell some slumberer wakened nigh what words the parent's joy could tell to hear his infant's cry concealed beneath a tumbled heap his hurried search had missed all glowing from his rosy sleep the cherub boy he kissed nor scathe had he nor harm nor dread but the same couch beneath lay a gaunt wolf all torn and dead tremendous still in death ah what was then llewellyn's pain for now the truth was clear his gallant hound the wolf had slain to save llewellyn's heir vain vain was all llewellyn's woe best of thy kind adieu the frantic blow which laid thee low this heart shall ever rue and now a gallant tune they raise with costly sculpture deck and marbles storied with his praise poor gellert's bones protect there never could the spearman pass or forester unmoved there off the tear besprinkled grass llewellyn's sorrow proved and there he hung his horn and spear and there as evening fell in fancy's ear he oft would hear poor gellert's dying yell and till great snowdon's rocks grow old and cease the storm to brave the consecrated spot shall hold the name of gellert's grave End of section one hundred and seven
this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and eight of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone the wearing of the leek an old song translated from the welsh by henry davis cadwallon the hero of the following song was king of wales in the seventh century for many years he resisted the advance of the saxons but was finally defeated and slain at havenfelth in his memory the leek is worn on the first of march the editor when king cadwallon famed of old midst tumults and alarms with dauntless heart and courage bold led on the british arms he bade his men ne'er fret and grieve nor doubt the coming fray for well he knew it was the eve of great saint david's day the saxons in their wild distress of this their hour of need disguise them in the british dress the hero to mislead but soon the welshman's eager ken perceived the craven play and gave a leak to all his men upon saint david's day behold the gallant monarch cried a trophy bright and green and let it for our battle guide in every helm be seen that when we meet as meet we must the saxons proud array we all may know in whom to trust on good saint david's day anon arose the battle shout the crash of spear and bow but i the green leak pointed out the welshman from his foe the saxons made a stout defence but fled at length away and conquest crowned the british prince on great saint david's day we'll cherish still that field of fame whate'er may be our lot which long as wallia hath a name shall never be forgot and braver badge we ne'er will seek whatever others may but still be proud to wear the leek on good saint david's day end of section one hundred and eight this recording is in the public domain Section 109 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Read for LibriVox.org. Wales, Part 2. Stories of the Welsh Rebellions. Historical Note. Wales was forced to acknowledge the sovereignty of William the Conqueror, but the freedom-loving people never fully yielded to Norman authority. When Edward I came to the throne of England, he determined to subjugate this troublesome little country. First he bade Suellen ap Griffith come to him and pay him homage of a vassal, but the wary prince refused to trust himself in the hands of Edward. An English invasion resulted. Suellen was overcome and forced not only to pay homage annually, but also to give up a goodly share of his lands. In 1284 Wales was put under English rule, and English laws were introduced. According to legend, Edward planned to appease the pride of the Welsh by promising them a prince who had been born in Wales and had never spoken a word of English. This prince proved to be his baby son, who was born at Carnarvon in Wales. The Welsh, however, were not long satisfied with this sop to Cerberus, and in 1402 a formidable revolt broke out under the leadership of Owen Glendower. This was the last national uprising. In 1536, Wales was incorporated with England, and all the rights and privileges of English subjects were accorded to the Welsh. The history of the country since that date is therefore blended with that of England. 
End of section 109. This recording is in the public domain. Section 110 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The World Story, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 110. How the Welsh Kept the Christmas of 1115 by Sabine Baring Gould. In the story from which the following selection is taken, Roger has been sent as governor to the district between the Tawy and Typhi rivers, and his brother as bishop. The sufferings of the Welsh from the two tyrants have reached the point where they can no longer be borne. The result is the uprising described. The Editor Like an explosion of fire damp in a coal mine, sudden, far-reaching, deadly, so was the convulsion in South Wales. All was quiet today. On the morrow the whole land from the Bay of Cardigan to Morganoog was in flames. The rising had been prepared for with the utmost caution. The last to anticipate it were the soldiery under Roger, who was quartered in Cairo. Notwithstanding imperative orders from the bishop at Kha Uhadden to return to him, they had remained where they were, and had continued to conduct themselves in the same lawless manner as before. They scoffed at the tameness with which their insolence was endured. They are cunnel conies, de lapin, they said. Footnote, rabbits, and a footnote. Say, whist, and nothing more is seen of them than their white tails as they scuttle to their burrows. For centuries this had been an oasis of peace, unlapped by the waves of war. The very faculty of resistance was taken out of these men, who could handle a plough or brandish a shepherd's crook, but were frightened at the chime of a bowstring and the flash of a pike. Yet, secretly, arms were being brought into the valley, and were distributed from farm to farm and from cot to cot, and the men whose wives and daughters had been dishonoured, whose savings had been carried off, who had themselves been beaten and insulted, whose relatives had been hung as felons, were gripping the swords and handling the lances, eager for the signal that should set them free to fall on their tormentors, and that signal came at last. On Christmas Eve, from the top of Pen y Thinus, shot up a tongue of flame, at once from every mountainside answered flashes of fire, there was light before every house, however small. The great basin of Cayo was like a reversed dome of heaven, studded with stars. "'What is the meaning of this?' asked Roger, issuing from the habitation he had appropriated to himself, and looking round in amazement. "'It is the Pulgain,' replied his man, Pont d'Arche, who knew something of Welsh. "'Pulgain? What is that?' "'The coming in of Christmas.' They salute it with lights and carols and prayers and dances. Methinks I can hear sounds. Aye, they are coming to church. With torches, there are many. They all come. Then a man came rushing up the hill. He was breathless. On reaching where stood Roger, he gasped. They come, a thousand men, and all armed. It is a river of fire. Along the road could be seen a waving line of light and from all sides down the mountains ran cascades of light as well. There is not a man is not armed, and the women each bears a torch. They come with them to see revenge done on us. Then up came Cadell. He was trembling. Rogier, he said, this is no Pugain for us. The whole country is stirring. The whole people is under arms, and swearing to have our blood. We will show these conies of Cunwell that we are not afraid of them. They are no conies now but lions. Can you stand against a thousand men? And this is not all, I warrant. The whole of the Towie Valley and that of Typhi, all dovid, maybe all Wales is up tonight. Can you make your way through? Roger uttered a curse. I relish not running before these conies. 
Then tarry, and they will hang you beside Cunoil's bell, where you slung their kinsmen. Roger's face had become mottled with mingled rage and fear. Meanwhile his men had rallied around him, running from the several houses they were lodging in. A panic had seized them. Some, without awaiting orders, were saddling their horses. Hark! shouted Roger. What is that? The river of light had become a river of song. The thunder of the voices of men and the clear tones of the women combined, and from every rill of light that descended from the heights to swell the advancing current came the strain as well. They have come caroling, said Roger disdainfully. Carol, call you this? exclaimed Cadell. It is the war song of the sons of David. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. Like as the smoke vanisheth, so shalt thou drive them away. And like as wax melteth at the fire, so let the ungodly perish. I will hear no more, said Roger. Mount, and heaven grant us a day when we may revenge this. I will go too, said Cadell. Here I dare not remain. Before the advancing river of men arrived at the crossing of the Anel, the entire band of the Normans had fled. Not one was left. Then up the ascent came the procession. First went the staff of Cunul, not now in its gold and gem-encrusted shrine, but removed from it, a plain rough ashen stick, borne aloft by Morgan Ap Saisult, its hereditary guardian, and behind him came Meredith, with his two attendant bards, all with their harps, striking them as the multitude intoned the battle-song that, for five hundred years, had not sounded within the sanctuary of David. The women bore torches aloft, the men marched four abreast, all armed and with stern faces, and Pabo was there and led them. The archpriest, on reaching the church, mounted a block of stone and dismissed the women. Let them return to their homes. A panic had fallen on those who had molested them, and they had fled. The work was but begun, and the men alone could carry it on to the end. Roger and his men did not draw rein till they had reached the Istrid Tawi. The broad valley through which flowed the drainage of the Brecknock Mountains, and there they saw that on all sides beacons were kindled, in every hamlet resounded the noise of arms. At Llandalo they drew themselves into Denevor, which had but a slender garrison, but there they would not stay, and avoiding such places as were centres of gathering to the roused natives, they made for Carmarthen. The castle there was deemed impregnable. It was held mainly by Welsh mercenaries in the service of Gerald of Windsor. Rogier mistrusted them. He would not remain there, for he had heard that Griffith ap Rees, at the head of large bodies of insurgents, was marching up Carmarthen. Next day the brother of the bishop was again on the move with his men by daybreak, and passed into the Clethau Valley, making for Chlau Harden. In the meantime, the men of Cayo were on the march. None were left behind save the very old and the very young and the women. They marched four abreast, with the staff of Cunoil borne before them. Now the vanguard thundered the battle song of David. Cafoded du, guascara i elinion, afoed i gassion, o e flyen f. They sang, then ceased, and the rearguard took up the chant. When thou wentest forth before the people, when thou wentest through the wilderness, the earth shook and the heavens dropped. They sang on and ceased. Thereupon again the vanguard took up the strain. Kings with all their armies did flee and were discomforted, and they of the household divided the spoil. Thus chanting alternately, they marched through the passage among the mountains threaded by the San Helen, and before the people went Pabo, wearing the bracelet of Maximus, the Roman emperor, who took to wife that Helen who had made the road, and who was of the royal British race of Cunetha. So they marched on, following the same course as that by which the Norman cavalcade had preceded them. And this was the Pulgain in Dovid in the year 1115. 
the host came out between the portals of the hills at Hlanurda, and turned about and descended the Istrad Tawi by the right bank of the river, and the daybreak of Christmas saw them opposite Hlangadok. The grey light spread from behind the mighty ridge of Tichrug, and revealed the great fortified lonely camp of Khan Goch, towering up with its mighty walls of stone, and the huge cairn that occupied the highest point within the enclosure. They halted for a while, but for a while only, and then thrust along in the same order, and with the same resolution, intoning the same chant, on their way to Hlandalo. There they tarried for the night, and every house was open to them, and on every hearth there was a girdle-cake for them. In the morrow the whole body was again on the march. Meanwhile the garrison had fled from Dinavor to Kareg Kanan, and the men of Istrid Taui were camped against that fortress from which, on the news of the revolt, Gerald had escaped Carmarthen. By the time the men of Cayo were within sight of this latter place, it was in flames, and tidings came from Cardigan. The people there had, with one acclaim, declared that they would have Griffith as their prince, and were besieging Strongbow's castle of Blindporth. But the men of Cayo did not tarry at Carmarthen to assist in the taking of the castle. Only there did Pabo surrender the bracelet of Maxan to the prince with the message from his sister. They pushed on their way. Whither were they bound? Slowly, steadily, resolvedly, on the track of those men who had outraced them to their place of retreat and defence, the bishop's castle of Hauerharden. Now when Bernard heard that all Kaya was on the march, and came on unswervingly towards where he was, behind strong walls and defended by mighty towers, then his heart failed him. He bade Roger hold out, but for himself he mounted his mule, rode to Tenby Castle, nor rested there, but took ship and crossed the mouth of the Severn Estuary to Bristol, where he hasted to London to lay tidings before the king, and with him went Cadell, the chaplain. It was evening when the host of Cayo reached Hlauharden, and Roger from the walls heard the chant of the war psalm. God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such a one as goeth on still in his wickedness, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies, and that the tongue of thy dogs may be read through the same. He shuddered, a premonition of evil. Pabo would have dissuaded his men from an immediate assault, but they were not weary, they were eager for the fray. They had cut down and were bearing faggots of wood, and carried huge bundles of fern. Some faggots went into the moat, others were heaped against the gates. The episcopal barns were broken into, and all the straw brought forth. Then flames were applied, and the draught carried the fire with a roar within. By break of day, Hlauharden Castle was in the hands of the men of Cayo. They chased its garrison from every wall of defence. They were asked for and gave no quarter. Those who had so long tyrannised over them lay in the galleries, slain with the sword, or thrust through with spears. Only Roger, hung by the neck, dangled from a beam thrust through an upper window. End of section 110. This recording is in the public domain. Section 111 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Seaton. The World Story, Volume 10. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 111. When the Eighteen Fell, 1282, by Owen Rushkamil. On Thursday, December the 10th, 1282, Fluin, Ap Grufid, received a message from the plotters, luring him to Aberdu, some miles down the Wye, below Booth, and on the other side of the stream, the snow was lying white on the world, and the rivers, deeper then, 
than now, running black and full. But the ford across the Y at Thekrit was still passable. Choosing eighteen of his household men, his bodyguard, Felwyn, rode to Thekrit and crossed. There he left his eighteen to hold the ford till he should come back, and then, attended only by one squire, young Grono Vichen, son of his minister, and Nevid Vichen, he pushed on down the valley to Aberdu. At Aberdu, he was to meet a young gentlewoman, who was to conduct him to a stealthy meeting with some chiefs of that district. If it be asked why he rode thus, almost alone and almost unarmored, the answer is that he was on a secret errand, in which he must not attract attention to himself until he had seen the local chiefs, and arranged all the details of a rising on their part. The more secret and sudden that rising was, the more likely it was to succeed. He was taking one of the risks that a fearless captain takes in such a war. It was like him to do it, for he was a steadfast soul. At Aberdu, however, the gentleman was not there to meet him. In truth, the whole message was part of the plot of Gifford and the Mortimers, though he did not know it yet. Yet as he waited, he thought of how the snow would betray which way he went, either in going to the secret meeting with the chiefs, or in stealing away for safety from any sudden enemies. Therefore he went to the smith of the place, Red Maddock, of the Wide Mouth, and bade him take the thin shoes off the horses, and put them on again backwards. Anyone finding his tracks after that would think he had been coming, not going. Then, as dark fell, he found the Mortimers with their horsemen were closing in round the place. Danger was upon him indeed. Swiftly he stole away with his squire, and hid himself in a cave which may still be seen at Abadi. All the night he lay hidden, and then, as soon as the earliest grey of dawn crept over the snowy earth, he stole away with his squire again, and rode back to Thekrid. He could only go slowly, so he had to go stealthily, for his horse could not gallop, because of its shoes being backwards. At Thekrid he found his faithful eighteen, but by this time the river was too high for crossing there. They must find some bridge, now the nearest bridge was the one at Ulf, under the walls of the great castle. Thelwyn believed that by the trick of the horseshoes he had thrown the Mortimers off his track. Also, he remembered that Ulf Castle was to be delivered to him according to promise. He took his eighteen men and rode back to the bridge of Ulf, a great distance down the valley. He reached the bridge barely in time. The Mortimers at Abadu had terrified Red Maddock the smith into confessing the trick of the horseshoes. Like hounds they were following his trail, and now they caught sight of him crossing the bridge with his little troop. The bridge was of wood like the rest of the bridges of that district. Thelowin turned and broke it down behind him, the black flood of the full Y mocking the Mortimers as they drew rein on their panting steeds before the broken timbers. Their hoped-for victim had escaped for the moment. In their fury they turned and dashed back down the valley to cross Erid, now called Erwood, eight miles below. Thelowin expected the castle of Bulith to be given up to him, but the garrison refused, doubtless, making some excuse of waiting till the country had risen. He could not waste time. The bridge on the road to Senibed was gone. He took his eighteen and led the way along the southern bank, the Yervon, to another bridge, just above the little church of Thaninus. There he crossed and posted the eighteen to hold that bridge, doubtless feeling himself safely returned from a great peril. In thankfulness for that escape, too, he caused a white friar to hold a service for him, perhaps at the end of the bridge perhaps in the little church of Thaninus, beside the dark Yvron. It does not matter much where the service was held. The whole of that ground was to be made sacred that day. This done, Thelowin went up to the garage, 
of Fenver, a farmstead belonging to the parish church of Bulis, doubtless to get food in an hour's sleep after the cold watching of that winter's night in the cave. After a frosty night of scout work, one's eyes get very heavy when one gets warm next day, and a great drowsiness stills the blood, even of the stubbornest man. Meanwhile, the Mortimers had crossed the Wye at Airwood, and with Gifford were riding fast for the bridge of Arroanum, where the eighteen held their post. In headlong haste, their leading squadron charged the bridge, but the eighteen had not been chosen in vain. They kept the bridge. While the clamor was at its height, Grano Vaichan roused Fruin and told him of it. Are not my men at the bridge? demanded the prince. They are, answered Grano. Then I care not if all of England were on the other side, returned Fruin proudly. He knew that manner of men he had left to hold that bridge. But down in front of the bridge, where the enemy were shouting in their baffled rage, as they tried in vain to hew a way across, one of Gifford's captains spoke out. It was Helius apt Philip Walwyn from lower down the Wye. We shall do no good here, he shouted, but I know a ford, a little distance off, that they do not know of. Let some of the bravest and strongest come with me, and we can cross and take the bridge in the rear. At once the bravest crowded after Helius to the ford where the water seems as dark and deep in winter as the rest of the long black pool on either hand, they crossed. The eighteen were charged in rear as well as in front, but they kept faith, where Thelowin had posted them. There they died, as men should end, proudly fighting, so they ended. Till the eighteen fell, says the bard, it was well with Thelowin up Gruford. Then over their bodies poured all the mass of Mortimer's men, with Giffords to seek Thelowin's little force on the high ground beyond. Fast the horsemen spurred, and as they hastened they came suddenly upon an unarmored man with one companion, hurrying on foot towards where the bridge was roaring under from the trampling host. One of the horsemen, Stephen or Adam of Frankton, in Thelowin's old lordship of Ellesmere, dashed forward with his men, and one ran his lance through the younger of the two. The other one was running up through the little dingle to get back to the army above in time to lead it in the coming battle. On the bank above the little spring at the head of the dingle grew a great spread of broom. Benadel. In the brush of broom, Frankton overtook the man and ran his spear out through him in a mortal wound. That man was Selwyn. The accident had happened. Go to the spot, and the people will tell you that no broom has ever grown again in Thangenton Parish from that dark day to this. So died Thelowin ap Gruffid, a gallanter soul of a past to God. End of section 111. This recording is in the public domain. Section 112 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 10. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 112 The Rebellion of Owing Lindur 1402-1415 By Owen Roscommel Many a victory Glyndur won in the field. He defeated and ruined Grey. But he was a statesman in war too. He made an alliance with the King of France. He sent to make alliances with the Scots and the Irish. Once, indeed, he formed such an alliance with part of the English against the usurping Henry that it seemed for a moment as if he must win all that he dreamt of. 
for one of his generals, Reith Gessin, had defeated Edmund Mortimer in a great battle at Pileth in what is now Radnorshire, capturing Mortimer himself. Now Mortimer's nephew, the boy Earl of March, had a better right to the crown of England than Henry had, so far as the law went. Henry, therefore, kept the boy a prisoner at Windsor, and was glad enough to hear that Mortimer was a prisoner of the terrible Glyndur. While he remained a prisoner, Mortimer could not try to get the crown of England for his nephew. But Mortimer had a brother-in-law in the famous Hotspur, son of Earl Percy of Northumberland, and Hotspur was not pleased that his wife's brother should remain a prisoner. He demanded that King Henry should arrange for the ransom of Mortimer, as he had arranged for the ransom of Grey when Glyndur had captured him. Henry, however, refused. Now Henry owed his throne to the help which the Percys had given him. Glyndur had, from the first, kept in touch with Percy and spared the Mortimer possessions plain proof that from the first he had been planning to use the right of the young Earl of March against Henry. Henry's refusal to mount some Mortimer was the one thing he wanted. He entered into negotiations in earnest with Hotspur and Mortimer to drive out Henry. He succeeded with both. Mortimer not only agreed, but married Glyndura's daughter Joan. The plan was that the Percys should come down from the north and join with Mortimer and Glyndur for a march on London. Before they started, however, Glyndur would have to take the last moment for a fierce campaign against the Lord's Marchers and the Flemings of the south, so as to leave Cymru secure while he should be gone. Had the Percys stuck to the plan, it must have succeeded, in all human probability but it was Hotspur who led the men of the north to join Owen, and Hotspur was ever a hothead. When he reached Cheshire, which Owen harried from first to last, because it was an enemy to Henry, and found him joined by all that county, as well as by the Cymra of the nearest Cantrebs, he thought he was strong enough to pull down Henry single-handed. He turned east instead of keeping to the plan, and marched to join Owen. It was the old mistake of Luc de Tannay over again, overconfidence, and it had a like result. For Henry was too strong and too ready. Too late Hotspur turned back and took up the original plan again. Henry was too swift for him. Hotspur reached Shrewsbury only to find that Henry, with an army twice as large as his own, was there in the town before him. All that bravery could do to retrieve a fatal mistake was done next day in battle. But it was done in vain, and Glendur, finishing his work in the south and turning at last to come and meet his ally, was met by the news that Hotspur had been slain and his army destroyed in one of the bloodiest battles of British history, the Battle of Shrewsbury, 1403. Yet, though so much was lost in that mistake of Hotspur's, Glyndur never lost heart. He had the true hero soul that, like a star, burns only the brighter the deeper the darkness spreads around it. He still fought on, still made his power felt, still ruled Cymru. He terrified Parliament as no Cymric prince had ever terrified it before. In 1404, Parliament granted leave to the people of Shropshire to pay him tribute to save themselves. In 1408, Shrewsbury refused to open its gates to the king's army for fear of him. The Flemings of Divid paid their price to him after he had defeated them and brought fire and sword to their doors. Countless castles were destroyed. To the bitter end he refused to yield. It is not known where he died, though it is inferred that he died in 1416. In Gwent they say that he did not die. They say that he and his men sit sleeping in Ogov e Dinis, buckled in their armour, their spears leaning against their shoulders, their swords across their knees. 
they are waiting till the day comes for them to sally forth and fight for the land again. End of section 112 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 113 of England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone The March of the Men of Harlech, 1468 National Cambrian War Song Translated by John Oxenford while Edward the Fourth was reigning in England, he sent the Earl of Pembroke against the mighty castle of Harlech and demanded that it be given up to him. Its defender, David Ennion, replied, I held a tower in France till all the old women in Wales heard of it, and now all the old women in France shall hear how I defend this castle. He made a stout resistance, but was finally obliged to yield to famine. The national war song, of which the following is a translation, is said to have been composed during this siege. The Editor Men of Harlech march to glory, victory is hovering o'er ye, bright-eyed freedom stands before ye, hear ye not her call at your sloth she seems to wonder rend the sluggish bonds asunder let the war cries deafening thunder every foe appall echoes loudly waking hill and valley shaking till the sound spreads wide around the saxon's courage breaking your foes on every side assailing forward press with heart unfailing till invaders learn with quailing cambria ne'er can yield thou who noble cambria wrongest know that freedom's cause is strongest freedom's courage lasts the longest ending but with death freedom countless hosts can scatter freedom stoutest mail can shatter freedom thickest walls can batter fate is in her breath see they now are flying dead are heaped and dying over might hath triumphed right our land to foes denying upon their soil we never sought them love of conquest hither brought them but this lesson we have taught them cambria ne'er can yield End of section 113. This recording is in the public domain. Section 114 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The World's Story, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, edited by Eva March Tavern, Section 114, How a Welshman Became King of England, 1485, by Owen Roscommel. Toward the end of the 15th century, Richard III succeeded in usurping the throne of England, his tyranny and crimes by which he had accomplished his object so aroused the English people that they invited Henry Tudor, a descendant of John of Gaunt, 
and also of owen tudor a welsh gentleman who had married the widow of henry v to become their sovereign he landed at milford in fourteen eighty five and was soon engaged in a fierce battle with richard at bosworth henry was successful and was crowned on the battlefield as henry the seventh the editor cloudily down the morning of that monday august twenty second fourteen eighty five when henry tudor drew out the host of his gallant countrymen for the battle that was to close a thousand years of struggle it was to close more it was to close the medieval period of british history and to open the modern day the day of our own empire richard the third king that morning drew out his host from its tents at sutton and saw two miles to his left front the host of henry king that night to his right front on hanging hill at nethercoton he saw the host of sir william stanley the men of northeast cambry on his immediate right lay lord stanley's men he sent to order lord stanley to join him but lord stanley would not come then richard measured what he had to do his army was nearly equal in numbers to all the other three combined it was far better equipped and armored moreover it was composed for the most part of veteran troops there were no sweepings of jails and hospitals with him like the men that henry had brought from france the ground too was all in richard's favor in front of him ran out the long tongue of ambien hill round it on the north and west lay a long winding marsh between him and the other armies that marsh could only be crossed at staniford where the ancient trackway which he had followed from stapleton ran on down from ambien hill to shenton and henry's camp therefore he would take up a position at the end of the ridge of anbion hill overlooking sandiford crossing and there wait henry's coming richard was one of the best generals of his day but if he were to march straight off to do it then lord stanley yonder on his right might swing round the head of the marsh and attack him from behind just when the others attacked him in the front that would mean certain defeat therefore he commanded the earl of northumberland whose men were as many as lord stanley's to stand fast where he was and keep lord stanley off then with his eight thousand and more of veterans he set forward along the ridge of anbion hill henry tudor as he drew out his men from the camp at whitmore could look across the marsh and see the plain of redmore beyond it swelling up into the crest of anbion hill on that crest he could see the front of richard's army one wide wave of glittering steel ranging into position he saw what richard intended he knew that he himself must cross the marsh and attack anbion hill every disadvantage was with henry his own men including the worthless foreigners were not nearly so many as richard's he had sent for lord stanley and lord stanley had refused to come to him but he still trusted sir william stanley for sir william's men were kimry he knew that the marsh could only be crossed at sandiford the ancient trackway from his camp led to that crossing and onward to richard's position the track would lead him the right way then the marsh would protect his right flank while he marched to sandiford and there when he turned the head of the column to the right to cross the little stream the troops of sir william stanley would be but a mile or so away behind him on hanging hill then sir william could follow him on over the crossing and join him in the attack it was the only plan now and he marched to carry it out when he came to sandiford he led the way across the marsh to array his men on redmore beyond still no stanley came but it was ten o'clock and the battle must be fought stanley or no stanley above him rose the steel-crowned crest of anbion and the harvest sun shone dazzlingly into the eyes of his archers as they faced the slope behind them was the wide marsh to cut them off from retreat or flight if they were beaten they were few and the foes were many they were on the low ground and the foe with his cannon was on the high ground to attack now would be boldness indeed but they were bold hearts they attacked when the order was given to prepare lord says the old chronicler how hastily the soldiers buckled on their helms how quickly the archers bent their bows and flushed the feathers of their arrows 
how readily the billmen shook their bills and proved their staves ready to approach and join when the terrible trumpet should sound the blast to victory or death the chronicler used the right word there it was a case of victory or death to the leaders for henry was striking for the crown that meant life and safety to him the exiles were striking for the home that was the only place in the world for them the Kimry were striking in the fire of a pride that nothing could kill. Well might Richard feel haunted. He looked at all the Kimrick banners arranged against him, and he called for a bowl of burgundy, and turned to his squire, Reist Viken. Here, Viken, he cried, I drink to thee, the truest Welshman that ever I found in Wales. And with the words he drank the wine, threw the bowl behind him, and gave the word for the onset his van was stretched from the marsh on the right to the marsh on the left a very terrible company to them that should see them afar off says the chronicler in the centre were the archers and on either hand of them two wings of men-at-arms covered with steel from top to toe behind them on the hill were richard and his main body with the cannon henry's van was thin because his men were fewer but they were enough the trumpet blew the soldiers shouted the king's archers let fly their arrows but henry's bowmen stood not still they paid them back again then the terrible shot once over the armies came to hand strokes and the matter was dealt with blades henry's tactics were all boldness he still felt that sir william stanley's men must come in for they were kimbry too unlike lord stanley's therefore he pressed the fight on richard's left till his van had outflanked it by this movement he could face the slope now with the sun at his back while it shone in the faces of richard's men dazzling their eyes in turn by this movement too he got richard's army between him and sir william stanley so that it would be taken in front and rear when stanley charged a thing that would mean complete disaster for richard richard saw that and with his cavalry swung round to come on henry's right flank and rear but there was another green spread of marsh where now wave anbian woods and it was too soft his good white horse stuck fast shouting for another horse he mounted again and led the thundering charge straight at henry's flank but earl jasper was watching he had the main body of henry's men under him the men of old de Haybarth and with the gallant earl of oxford continued the fight in the van against the duke of norfolk jasper faced his men to meet the desperate richard and beat back his furious onset thus in a ray triangle the fight raged on keenly henry watched the fight now or never was the moment where was will stanley with his kimry in his anxiety he rode back attended only by his bodyguard and standard bearer towards sandiford to where he could see if will stanley was coming and as he drew rein to look one of richard's men saw him and sped away with the news to his master richard was pausing for a drink from the spring which is to this day called king richard's well when the word was brought to him he saw at once that he still had one last desperate chance if he could reach and kill henry then the victory would be his seeing that there would be no one left for henry's men to fight for he seized the chance let all true knights follow me he shouted and spurred away over the hill to where he should find henry fast poured the flower of richard's knights after him while henry's bodyguard saw the onset coming and closed its ranks to defend him richard marked the great standard that sir william brandon bore and he charged upon it like a demon he unhorsed huge sir john cheney who tried to bar his way he slew the standard bearer and laid a hand upon the standard itself but giant rees of mered of nant conwy seized it from him and drove him back a breath while henry himself met him with a fury that astonished friend and foe richard raged like a madman but it was all too late now sir william's men were here at last richard ap howell of moston with the rest and the best king richard was borne back fighting like ten men yet still borne back his horse fell his lords and knights were dead or dying fast around him still he raged on then came dark reese thomas 
seeking the king who had once threatened him and tradition tells how the blade of dark reese ended the life of the last norman king richard the third the fall of richard was the end of the battle too for all his men fled at that northumberland laid down his arms there was no more to fight for lord stanley whose troops had never struck a blow hurried over to henry whose men were following the flight of the vanquished but all was not done yet the long fierce dream of the stubborn Kimry were to be fulfilled to the very letter they had come into england to win the crown of britain back for one of the old blood of its founder they did it in very deed for when the chase was ended the crown of dead king richard was found in a hawthorn bush and lord stanley lifted it and placed it on the head of henry thus was the long dream fulfilled the crown of britain was come back to the descendant of its founder at last and the wild shout of triumph with which the victors hailed their countryman king is remembered to this day in the name of the field in which they stood and watched him crowned its name means the field of the shout you may still see the stone whereon that crowning took place it is in stoke golding and the spot is still called crown hill in memory of the only time that ever a king of england was crowned on the field of battle lost in battle that crown had come back in battle did the bones of all the slain generations of the kimry who had struggled for this day stir in their red graves at that shout surely their spirits knew when the work was done at last surely a sound like the moving of a mighty wind must have swept over kimry for the ghost of all the heroes slain in the battles of the thousand years of struggle could leave their graves at last and go to god the long work done the victory won the nunc dimittis chanted o'er the mountains as they passed end of section 114 this recording is in the public domain section 115 of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox.org by sonia wales part 3 scenes of welsh life historical note the devotion of the welsh to their country and its customs and to literature and music brought about the establishment of the a stedford a musical festival which is attended by many thousand persons the word a stedford means a session or sitting and originated perhaps long before the christian era in the gorset which was in great degree a political assembly although the gorset lost its political power it retained a strong hold upon the people of wales as a means of encouraging the love of music and poetry and of preserving the national customs chairs were established or conventions where musicians were trained four of these now exist in wales it was probably at some time during the sixth century that eisteddfodau began to be held and for many years they took place triennially every means was employed to improve the music and encourage the musicians rewards were given a silver harp to the chief musician and a silver chair to the chief bard during the last fifty years many local aestad for thy have been held and a provincial one almost every year the latter must be proclaimed by a bard who is a graduate of one of the chairs a year and a day before the time set when the day arrives there is first of all a gorset meeting announced by the blast of trumpets here deserving candidates receive the degree of bard at the close of the celebration comes chair day or the time of rewarding the prize winners end of section 115 this recording is in the public domain section 116 of england scotland ireland and wales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna Childs. Facebook.com slash author Brianna Childs. The World's Story, Volume 10. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 116. The Estedfod by Jeanette Marks. It was the first morning of my first Welsh national estedfod, 
and I sat by the window working, and glancing away from my work to a hillside up which led narrow steps to the summits above, among which were hidden away some half a dozen tiny villages. Colwyn Bay, where the Estadfad was to be held, was, as the crow does not fly, about forty miles distant. It was a glorious morning of sunshine in which gleamed the river, glossy beaches and pines, and little whitewashed Welsh cottages. As I looked, there began to emerge from the steps a stream of people. Down and down they flowed, bright in their pretty dresses or shining in their black Sunday bests broadcloth. All those mountain hamlets up above, reached by the roads passable only for mountain ponies, were sending their men, women, and children to the Welsh festival of song and poetry. Talking and excited about who would be chaired as bard, who would be crowned, what female choir would win the choral contest, what male choir, and discussing a thousand little competitions, even to a set of insertions for sheets, shams, and towels, we were born on the train from Bretis Ucoid, swiftly through the Vale of Conway beside the river, past Carhun, the once ancient city of Canovium, past Conway Castle with its heart-shaped walls still encircling the town, and so to Colwyn Bay. Then all these enthusiastic people who had climbed down a hill to take the train climbed up another to see the first corset ceremony. As we passed... From one of the cottages was heard the voice of a woman screaming in excitement, Mrs. Jones! Mrs. Jones, come to the front door quickly! There's some people going by! They're dressed in blue and white! Dear me, Mrs. Jones, they're men! The procession, fully aware that Mrs. Jones and all the little Joneses and all the big and middling Joneses, too, had come, went on gravely up, up the hill to Ifanarig, the flagstaff, where stood the log of the gorset and its encircling stones. The paths were steep, and even bards and druids are subject to imbum point. Old Eostar, who can sing Penelian with never a pause for breath, lost his wind, and the bearer of the great sword of gorset was no more to be found. A boy scout perhaps thinking of Scott's minstrel, who said, The way was long, the wind was cold, the minstrel was infirm and old, was dispatched downhill after him, and found him and the sword, arm in arm, lagging comfortably behind. Juridical deportment is astonishingly human at times. But the hilltop achieved, and when recovered, the bards soberly made their way into the juridical circle of stones, that surrounds the great gorsed stone. Nowhere, as the archdruid remarked, had the bardic brotherhood been brought nearer heaven. From the summit, north, east, south, west, the soft valleys, the towering mountains, the secluded villages, the shining rivers, and the great sea were visible. And there, on this hilltop, the bards, Druids and ovates, dressed in blue and white and green robes, celebrated rites only less old than the Eye of Light itself. After the sounding of the trumpet, Corn Gulad, the Gorset prayer was recited in Welsh, Grant, O God, thy protection, and in protection strength, and in strength understanding, and in understanding knowledge and in knowledge, the knowledge of justice, and in the knowledge of justice, the love of it, and in that love, the love of all existence, and in the love of all existence, the love of God, God and all goodness. Then the archdruid Dyfed, standing upon the gorsed stone and facing the east, unsheathed the great sword, crying out thrice, Awis hedoch! Is it peace? And the bards in Ovates replied, Hiroch, peace. There are some scholars who question the identity of the bardic gorset with the druidic system. 
The Welsh course said, this side of the controversial point, is forty centuries old, and in all conscience that is old enough. Diodorus the Sicilian wrote, There are among the Gauls makers of verses whom they name bards. There are also certain philosophers and theologists, exceedingly esteemed, whom they call druids. Strabo, the geographer, says, Amongst the whole of the Gauls, three classes are especially held in distinguished honor, the bards, the prophets, and the druids. The bards are singers and poets, the prophets are sacrificers and philosophers, but the druids, besides physiology, practiced ethical philosophy. As far back as we can look into the life of the Cambri, poetry, song, and theology have been inextricably woven together. The Gorsed was then formally, for the Welsh people, what it still is informally a popular university, a law court, a parliament. The modern Gorsed, with its twelve stones, is supposed to represent the signs of the zodiac, through which the sun passes, with a central stone, called Meinschlog, in the position of the sacrificial fire in the Druidical temple. A close reverence for nature, a certain pantheism in the cults of the Druids, shows itself in various ways, in the belief that the oak tree was the home of the god of lightning, that mistletoe, which usually grows upon the oak, was a mark of divine favor. The most prominent symbol of the Gorsed is the broad arrow, or mystic mark, supposed to represent the rays of light which the Druids worshipped. Even the colors of the robes of the Druids Ovates and bards are full of characteristic worship of nature. The druids, in white, symbolical of the purity of truth and light. The ovates, in green, like the life and growth of nature. The bards, in blue, the hue of the sky and in token of the loftiness of their calling. Up there on the hilltop, with its vast panorama of hill and valley, sea and sky, Time became as nothing. The Gorsed became again the democratic Waitanachmad of the Welsh, and there still were represented the mountain shepherd, the pale collier, the lusty townsman, the gentle knight, the expounder of the law, the teacher, and the priest. But if upon the hill time was as nothing, down below in the gigantic Estesbad pavilion, some ten thousand people were waiting. Gallant little Wales, which has certainly awakened from its long sleep, was past the period of rubbing its eyes. It was shouting and calling for the Estestvad ceremonies to begin. Perhaps, as the folk in Kerwis had called impatiently in the days of the twelfth century, or again in that old town in the days of Elizabeth, the last, that memorable Estetfad, when a commission was appointed by Elizabeth herself to check the bad habits of a crowd of lazy, illiterate bards who went about the country begging. That great Estetfadic pavilion, where the people were waiting good-naturedly but impatiently, is a primarily a place of music. Even as in the world, so in Wales music comes first in the hearts of mankind and poetry second. And it may be, since music is more social and democratic, that the popular preference is as it should be. The human element in all that happens at the Welsh Estesfad is robust and teeming with enthusiasm. It is true that prize-taking socks, shawls, pillow shams, and such homely articles no longer hang in festoons above the platform as they did some twenty or thirty years ago. Now the walls are gaily decorated with banners bearing thousands of spiteful-looking dragons and pennants inscribed with the names of scores of famous Welshmen, and with such mottos as Aguir and Urban Abid. The Truth Against the World 
Gilad Mabinagion, Nagion, the land of the Mabinagion, Kalon Earth Kalon, Heart with Heart, and others. After the procession of dignitaries was seated upon the platform, a worried-looking bard began to call out prizes for every conceivably useful thing under the sun, among them a clock tower which he seemed to be in need of himself as a rostrum for his throat-splitting yells. During these announcements, the choirs were filing in. A pretty child with a cello much larger than herself was taking off her hat and coat, a stiff, self-conscious young man was bustling about with an air of importance, and in the front, just below the platform, sat newspaper reporters from all over the United Kingdom, busy at their work. Among them were the gray, the young, the weary, the dusty, the smart, the shabby, and one who wore a wig, but made up in roses in his buttonhole for what he lacked in hair. There were occasional cheers as some local prima donna entered the choir seats and many jokes from the anxious-looking master of ceremonies. At last the choir was assembled, and a little lady, somebody's good mother, mounted upon a chair. The choir began to sing, Come, sisters, come, where light and shadows mingle, and elves and fairies dance and sing upon the meadow land. The little lady never worked harder, her baton, her hands, her head, her lips, her eyes were all busy. Was it the Celtic spirit that made those elves and fairies seem to dance upon the meadows, or did they really dance? The next choir was composed of younger women, among them many a beauty-loving face. Alas, too pale and telling of hard life of the hills, or of the harder life of some mining town. Of the third choir, the leader was a merry little man, scarcely as high as the leader's stand, with a wild look in his twinkling eyes as he waved a baton, and the choir began, Far beneath the stars we lie, far from gaze of mortal eye, far beneath the ocean swell, here we merry mermaids dwell. He believed not only in his choir, but also in those mermaidens, and so did the little lad, not much bigger than Hoffman when he first began the tour, who played the accompaniment. When that choir went out, a fourth came in, still inviting the sisters to come. At last the sisters not only came, but also decided to stay, and another choir lured the sailor successfully to his doom, and all was over, for even in choir tragedies there must be an end to the song. The gallant little mother had won the first prize, it takes the mothers to win prizes, and the audience thought so too. The crowd yelled and stamped with delight. When one asks oneself whether Surrey, for example, or such a state as Massachusetts in America, could be brought to send its people from every farm, every valley, every hilltop, to a festival thousands strong, day after day for a whole week, one realizes how tremendous a thing this Welsh national enthusiasm is. Educationally, nothing could be a greater movement for Wales. To the Welsh, the beauty of worship, of music, of poetry are inseparable. Only so can this passion for beauty, which brings multitudes together to take part in all that is noblest and best in Welsh life, be explained. Only so can you understand why some young collier, pale and work-worn, sings with his whole soul, and shakes with the song within him, even as a bird shakes with the notes that are too great for its body. These Welsh sing as if music were all the world to them, and in it they forget the world. Behind the passion of their song lies a devout religious conviction, and their song sweeps up in praise and petition to an almighty God who listens to Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, as well as some great hymn. To hear ten thousand Welsh people singing, Land of my fathers, each taking naturally one of the four parts, and all singing in perfect harmony, is to have one of the great experiences of life. To hear Shelley's ode, set to Elgar's music and sung by several choirs, to hear that wild, far-traveling wind sweep along in a tumult of harmonies, to know that every heart there was as a liar even to the last breath of that wind. 
to hear that last cry. O oh, wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? To listen again to those choirs late in the evening on the station platform with the sea dim and vast and muting the song to its own greater music is to have felt in the Welsh spirit what no tongue can describe. It is to understand the meaning of the word huil, that untranslatable word of a passionate emotionalism. All that went on behind the scenes the audience could not know. I saw only those considered by the adjudicators fit to survive. They did not see the six blind people, for even the blind have their place in this great festival, who entered the little schoolroom off Erbergele Road to take the preliminary test. The girl who played the harmonious blacksmith and shaking from excitement and holding on to her guide, was led away unsuccessful. They did not see the lad who played Men of Harlech crudely, his anxious, aging, work-worn mother sitting beside him, holding his stick and nodding her head in approval. All they heard were a selected two who were considered by the judges fit to play, a man both blind and deaf who performed a scherzo of Brahms, and a Carnarvon sea captain, now blind, who played on the violin. The quiet of the one-time sea captain's face laid against the violin, the peace and pleasure in the lines about the sightless eyes would have repaid the whole audience, even if the violinist had not been an exceptionally good player, for listening. One of the inspiring and amusing events of the week was the discovery of a marvelous contralto, a young girl, shabbily dressed and ill at ease, came out to sing. Everything was being pressed forward towards the crowning of the bard, one of the great events of the Estesfad. People were impatient and somewhat noisy, but as the girl began to sing, they quieted down. Then they listened with wonder, and in a minute you could have heard a pin drop in that throng of ten thousand. Before she had finished singing, Jesu, lover of my soul, the audience knew that it had listened to one of the great singers of the world. When she had finished her song and unclasped her hands, she became again nothing more than an awkward, silly, giggling child whom Theotegid had to hold by the arm. The audience shouted, What's her name? Maggie Jones, he replied. That begins well. Where does she come from? demanded the crowd. Police station answered Hugh Tigid lugubriously. The audience roared with laughter and demanded the name of the town. Maggie Jones is the daughter of Police Superintendent Jones of Puechele. Perhaps in the years to come, the world will hear her name again. There are children at these Estefado whose little feet can scarce reach the pedals of a harp. Even the Romans, singing up in the high pavilion roof, who had joined in music from time to time, trilling joyously to Handel's Oh, had I Jubal's lyre, twittered with surprise that anything so small could play anything so large. But no one of the thousands there, even the children, grew tired for an instant, unless it was these same robins, who were weary at times because of the cheerless character of some of the sacred music sung in competition and themselves starting up singing blithely and gladly as God meant that birds and men should sing. The robins twittered madly when some sturdy little Welshman stepped into the Penelian singing, accompanied by the harp, no more to be daunted than a child stepping into rope-skipping. When the grown-ups had finished, two little children came forward and sang their songs, North Wales style. The afternoon was growing later and later, it was high time for the name of the bard of the crown poem to be announced. At last, with due pomp, the name of the young bard was announced. Everyone looked to see where he might be sitting. He was found sitting modestly in the rear of the big pavilion, and there were shouts of, Dimavo, here he is. Two bards came down and escorted him to the platform, where all the druids, the ovates, and bards were awaiting him. The band, the trumpeter, the harp, and the sword now all performed their service, the sun slanting down through the western windows onto this bardic pageant. 
the sparrows flew in and out of the sunlight unafraid of the dragons that waved about them and the bands that played beneath them and the great sword held sheathed over the young bard's head the sword was bared three times and sheathed again as all shouted Hedoch! the bard was crowned and the whole audience rose to the welsh national song what is the meaning of this unique festival of poetry and song mr lloyd george who had escaped from the din of the battle outside and the jeers of the goths and vandals who couldn't or wouldn't understand the fourth form said amidst laughter that there was no budget to raise taxes for the upkeep of the estafad then he continued the bards are not compelled by law to fill up forms there is no conscription to raise an army from the ranks of the people to defend the Estesfad's empire in the heart of the nation. And yet, after the lapse of generations, the Estesfad is more alive than ever. Well, what good is she? I will tell you one thing. She demonstrates what the democracy of Wales can do at its best. The democracy has kept her alive. The democracy has filled her chairs the sons of the democracy compete for her honors i shall never forget my visit to shangolfen estepad two years ago when crossing the hills between flintshire and the valley of the day i saw their slopes darkened with the streams of shepherds and cottagers and their families going towards the town what did they go to see to see a man of their nation honored for a piece of poetry and the people were as quick to appreciate the points as any expert of the gorset and wonderfully responsive to every lofty thought yes unlike any other gathering in the world the estafad is all that long ago in the latter half of the eighteenth century eolo morganug stated the objects of welsh bardism to reform the morals and customs to secure peace to praise or encourage all that is good or excellent this national festival is the popular university of the people it is the center of welsh nationalism the feast of welsh brotherhood only listened to in this spirit can one understand what it means when an aesthetic throng after the crowning of the bard rises to sing Hain blood fly not I. old land that our fathers before us held dear end of section 116 this recording is in the public domain end of the world's story a history of the word in story song and art volume 10 england scotland ireland and wales Edited by Eva March Tappan.